All right, welcome to Literary Hangover. I'm Matt Leck. With me, Alex Guns. Hello. And today we are talking uh, once again, for the first time since episode one, about a James Fenimore Cooper novel. Uh, James Fenimore Cooper being the first novelist in America who is actually able to uh, make it pay. Uh, and we are going to talk about the pioneers. Or, The Sources of the Susquehanna, A Descriptive Tale. Uh, it's a historical novel by Cooper. Uh, it was the first of five leather-stocking tale novels. Uh, published in 1823, The Pioneers is the fourth in terms of chronology of those novels. And one way to keep those straight is uh, they're in alphabetical order. Alex, uh, we were talking earlier, but uh, I think we both agree it's a big step up from uh, The Spy which was the very first episode of uh, Literary Hangover. Yeah, I think that we spent a good chunk of that episode uh, dunking on the verbiage and the bad characters and the very somewhat, not, not, I would almost said flimsy plot, but the overplotting of like, this person is really this person and they secretly feel this and blah, blah, blah. And it was an interesting historical relic, but not necessarily a good piece of writing. Whereas this is... Uh, the pioneers which is very interesting is it takes up some of the same themes but it's like a universe away in terms of quality yeah and uh well as in the spy there was harvey birch who is the sort of leather stocking prototype uh a man between sort of classes but basically has fealty to leadership yeah uh there was a hidden identity uh in uh well george washington was uh yeah but you could tell character. because he's just so nice it was basically his yeah his gentility uh shown through from the very beginning yeah but i would say this is much more uh like the characters are much more complex here judge uh temple marmaduke temple based on cooper's father um, and he's a very mixed character from the beginning. He's morally um, iffy, and you don't, you're not necessarily on his side, you, although I would say he probably comes across overall as a good man that is just lacking in certain areas. He's like a far more naturalistic take uh, on a way of telling a story. It, the, the way that the, the story is presented, it's stripped of any kind of moralizing or, or even like excessive verbiage describing the character's feelings or, or reasoning behind actions. Instead, you get this very uh, modernist take on it, which is like, the character does this, and the character does this, and this is what the scene looked like. And it, it lets the reader, it it takes the reader seriously, basically. Mm-hmm. It, lets, it lets the reader make their own deductions, and it enjoys the kind of uh, lack of clarity in a way that the spy, I think, it felt much more uncomfortable. Yeah, so let's uh, play a little bit from uh, James Fenimore Cooper's introduction. This was written nine years after the uh, first edition of uh, of The Pioneers was written. I've found a new appreciation for introductions doing this project, because I think authors always reveal quite a bit um, in them, but uh, here's James Fenimore Cooper. And uh, this is a LibriVox recording, so we don't get in trouble with any uh, copyright stuff. Introduction. As this work professes in its title page to be a descriptive tale, they who will take the trouble to read it may be glad to know how much of its contents is literal fact and how much is intended to represent a general picture. The author is very sensible that, had he confined himself to the latter, always the most effective as it is the most valuable mode of conveying knowledge of this nature, he would have made a far better book. But in commencing to describe scenes, and perhaps he may add characters, that were so familiar to his own youth, there was a constant temptation to delineate that which he had known, rather than that which he might have imagined. This rigid adhesion to truth, an indispensable requisite in history and travels, destroys the charm of fiction. For all that is necessary to be conveyed to the mind by the latter had better be done by delineations of principles and of characters in their classes, than by too fastidious attention to originals. That's an interesting, uh, I guess, revelation of how he approaches it and how this comes from the Walter Scott school of uh, he wrote Waverly and um, uh, Ivanhoe, which is basically this sort of historical fiction. Um, 
uh, where you have different classes of individuals uh, demonstrating larger principles. Uh, and I actually think it's a very interesting um, uh, way to write. I appreciate it a lot. I'm a big fan of uh, of this comparative to uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, who I think, I, th- I just think, frankly, I think this is more of an adult work than um, e- like all but maybe like The House of the Seven Gables. For, compared to Hawthorne, there's just like a lot more adult themes. He might not be as good um, as a pro stylist, but what he's incorporating into his work is a lot more weighty, um, in my opinion. Yeah, and I, th- I think the prose itself is also much more um, even keeled in a way that uh, Hawthorne and a lot of other writers that are reading a, a, in American literature at this time that they really get taken with the scene and they'll like they ape or or like pretend to be whatever form of of literature they want to be at that time which is but where cooper has this much more methodic way of writing that just it just goes line after line almost like uh poetry in a way Mm -hmm. new york having but one county off otsego and this lasquahanna but one proper source there can be no mistake as to the site of the tale the history of this district of country so far as it is concerned with civilized men is soon told otsego in common with most of the interior of the province of new york was included in the county of Albany previously to the War of the Separation. It then became, in a subsequent division of territory, a part of Montgomery. And finally, having obtained a sufficient population of its own, it was set apart as a county by itself shortly after the peace of 1783. It lies among those low spurs of the Alleghenies, which cover the Midland counties of New York, and is a little east of a meridional line drawn through the center of the state. As the water of New York flow either southerly into the Atlantic or northerly into Ontario and its outlet, Otsego Lake being the source of the Susquehanna is of necessity among its highest lands. The face of the country, the climate as it is found by the whites, and the manners of the settlers are described with a minuteness for which the author has no other apology than the force of his own recollections. Otsego is said to be a word compounded of ot, a place of meeting, and sago or sago, the ordinary term of salutation used by the Indians of this region. There is a tradition which says that the neighboring tribes were accustomed to meet on the banks of the lake to make their treaties, and otherwise to strengthen their alliances, and which refers the name to this practice. As the Indian agent of New York had a log dwelling at the foot of the lake, however, it is not impossible that the appellation grew out of the meetings that were held at his council fires. The war drove off the agent, in common with the other officers of the crown, and his rude dwelling was soon abandoned. This is true. The American Revolutionary War not only uh, drove off loyalists, but also uh, severely weakened the Iroquois League, which uh, massively opened up New York for settlement. The author remembers it a few years later, reduced to the humble office of a smokehouse. In 1779, an expedition was sent against the hostile Indians who dwelt about a hundred miles west of Otsego on the banks of the Cayuga. The whole country was then in wilderness, and it was necessary to transport the baggage of the troops by means of the rivers, a devious but practicable route. Uh, yeah, and it should be also noted uh, when he says the world is or the the country was wilderness that there was a they exploited a lot of uh, pre-existing uh, Native American infrastructure. Oh yeah, that's like always like the classic trope, and like you look at like westward expansion or even like New England expansion, you always hear these like firsthand accounts of like, oh, we, this must be providence by God. It's like the the route was uh, laying out before us, and it's like yes, but not for you. My favorite uh, uh, version of that, and maybe it's even come up earlier on the show, is settlers going through a wooded area and realizing that it's very, like, open. Like, there's no underbrush. Yeah, so yeah. So you can see for miles. Yeah. Uh, which is very helpful if you're hunting, for instance, right? Like, there's no place for deer to hide. Mm-hmm. And thinking, like, well, did God make this forest yeah, so yeah. it's really easy to hunt? And actually, no, Native Americans were just burning the underbrush so it was easy hunting lands. <laughs> um <laughs> yeah yeah i'm gonna skip a little bit ahead um for um some more from uh cooper here he puts his father uh in the lineage of uh first washington comes there and then uh his his dad judge temple uh and cooper is fairly open 
about the um as we've already heard you know there's only one county in central new york that this could be right so it's clearly he's based on the place where he grew up but he also as he grew older was more vehement about um you know these are fictional characters right and mainly that is copyright or not copyright um lawsuit well, well he says just as much right he's like it's it's better to just call this fiction right exactly soon after the close of the war washington accompanied by many distinguished men visited the scene of this tale it is said with a view to examine the facilities for opening a communication by water with other points of the country he stayed but a few hours in 1785 the author's father who had an interest in extensive tracts of land in this wilderness arrived with a party of surveyors the manner in which the scene met his eye is described by judge temple at the commencement of the following year the settlement began and from that time to this the country has continued to flourish it is a singular feature of american life that at the beginning of this century when the proprietor of the estate had occasion for settlers on a new settlement and in a remote county he was enabled to draw them from among the increase of the former colony although the settlement of this part of otsego a little preceded the birth of the author it was not sufficiently advanced to render it desirable that an event so important to himself should take place in the wilderness perhaps his mother had a reasonable distrust of the practice of dr todd who must then have been in the novitiate of his experimental acquirements be that as it may the author was brought an infant into this valley and all his first impressions were here obtained he has inhabited it ever since at intervals and he thinks he can answer for the faithfulness of the picture he has drawn so yeah it, it's it's a faithful picture but also don't uh, take it too seriously that and uh elizabeth is definitely not his sister <laughs> um, yeah yeah it's almost like that form of like redaction which is just a way of highlighting like where to look when uh it doesn't become redacted as i sometimes i feel like these prefaces for works that are based on real life but are fiction the things that they need to highlight that are definitely fiction it's like oh, that that's the thing that is definitely true yeah yeah and uh, Elizabeth, the sort of, uh, fe- of uh, heroine of the uh, novel, is probably, at least in part, based on uh, William's sister, who um, she was sort of the woman of the house uh, for a little bit until she died of a, uh, she fell off a horse and cracked her skull uh, right before she was about to get married and is very tragic and, and upset uh, Cooper quite a bit. Um I want to move now to Alan Taylor, probably definitely the most cited historian on Literary Hangover. Uh, And he actually did some early work uh, in the 90s on this very novel uh, and its relationship to the historical uh, record of William Cooper as a frontier sort of proprietor. We got two different C-SPAN appearances. Uh, The first one we're going to uh, play... Uh, is from April 23rd, 2001. Uh, and it, uh, it it basically talks about, uh, did uh, it starts off with a question of, did uh, James Fenimore Cooper come from money? A position more fitting to his genteel status and got him a commission in the U.S. Navy where he served a couple of years. Did the family have money? They had a great deal of money. They were the wealthiest family in this county, Otsego County, New York thanks to William Cooper's successful development of settlements here. Well, what was the story of why a man from New Jersey, James Fenor Cooper's father, would come to this place and establish himself? Well, he was a self-made man. He grew up in modest circumstances, but he made a fortunate marriage to Elizabeth Fenimore Cooper, who came from a family with a little bit more money. And he was a man of great ambition and very resourceful. And he discovered that there was a tract of land up here that um, was available if he could get up here and purchase it in an auction sale. And he got up here and he managed to manipulate the circumstances so that he was the prime bidder and he got it quite cheaply. The way he manipulated the circumstances, and we may get into this more, this is going to be a two-part episode, by the way. This is just part one. Um, is he? Uh, it's the sort of thing where you have to announce uh, an auction in a publication, a newspaper. Just make that really small and like... a. A back page somewhere yeah um and and try to do it before anybody gets word of it 
and thereafter he was able to sell lands retail to farmers who were moving here in great numbers from New England after the American Revolution, people moving here trying to get farms. When did uh, William Cooper die? William Cooper died in 1809. What effect did that have on his son James? Made him very rich. How so? Well, he's uh, in, inherited certain securities and lands that he thought would add up to $75,000, uh, which was a great deal of money at that time. This is a time in which um, a common farmer would be lucky to make $500 a year. And James Fenimore Cooper has suddenly come into property that he thinks is worth 75000 And this is true for all seven of his, all, excuse me, all six of his siblings. Uh, why would, was he an aristocrat? Well, he grew up in great wealth, but America didn't have a true aristocracy. There were people who hoped that they could become an aristocracy. And James Fenimore Cooper's father, William Cooper, hoped that he was passing on a secure estate to his heirs, but it turned out that that estate was profoundly insecure. And why would a man, James Fenimore Cooper, uh, of that uh, status become a writer of novels? Well, it's a very unusual thing um, for a man of his status at that time to become a novel writer. There were very few American novelists, very few of them, um, none of them in fact had any economic success with it. James Fenimore Cooper was a lover of novels. He got that from his father. He shared it with his wife. And his wife one day, um, while her husband was reading a novel, um, challenged him to write his own. And he decided that he would do so. It was a lark. He didn't expect to make any money by it. And indeed, he didn't make any money from his first novel. But he fell in love with the process, the imaginative process of creating characters and setting and controlling plot and reaching a conclusion that, that he found satisfying. And which made him wealthy, the land or the books? Well, ultimately, it was the books that, that made him not wealthy, but sustained him as a, in, in a great deal of prosperity. He began as a novelist at the very time that his inherited fortune collapsed. And the amazing thing is that by venturing into writing, he managed to make a new career, an income of his own, a substantial income. And he no longer was dependent upon inherited wealth, which was a good thing because it had all vanished. How many books did he write? Um, over 50, a mixture of histories and romances. Yet, social commentary. What is he known best for among all those books? Uh, his leather stocking novels. The first of them is The Pioneers, which was published in 1823 and is set right here beside this lake in and around Cooperstown, which is known as Templeton. And that series continued. The second of them that he published was The Last of the Mohicans. Do you have any idea of back in 1826, it is, when The Last of the Mohicans came out, what were the book sales like back then? Uh, well, for the type of book that he was publishing, which is uh, quite long, would be published initially in two separate volumes in hardcover, um, fairly limited sales, be fortunate to sell 10,000 copies, so that would be considered a great bestseller. And how much would a book cost in 1826? In the vicinity of $3, so that's a lot of money, that's about a week's wages for a laboring man. And who was his audience? Can you, dem the demographics of who would read back then? Well, they will be people that will be above average in their education and in their wealth. So they will be people of some gentility. They will be lawyers and doctors and ministers, but especially their wives and daughters. Let's go back to the phones. Louisville, you're on the air. Hello. Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> um, Mark, how did he go about getting published? I mean, was, was it difficult to hook up with the people that were going to uh, publish his novels? Um, how did he make the connection with the publishers? Like, All right, thank you. Well, it was very difficult for American authors to get published at that time. There was no international copyright, and therefore it was a lot cheaper for American publishers to pirate English novels. And so the great majority of things published in the United States, especially of fiction, were reprinted works from England. And so it was... Uh, difficult for Cooper to make connections, but he finally made quite successful connections, uh, especially with Charles Wiley, who published most of his novels. It's interesting, just uh, a little like benchmarkers. <clears throat> I always think of like Moby Dick is considered a failure because he couldn't break 10,000. Oh, interesting. And that's 30 years later. 
Right. So just like trying to imagine the speed at, or like the acceleration that America is at in that early period where 10,000 novels would or 10,000 sales would be a hit in in 1820s America, but 1850, that'd be a failure. And it was a failure. Yeah, it's I mean, it, it, the modern parallel, I guess, would be something like a YouTube view count. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like when the, the first YouTube went over 10 million views or whatever, it's probably amazing. But now it's like. There's lots of videos like that. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, yeah. I'm going to go a little bit uh, further on in this uh, C-SPAN with Alan Taylor here. Does he still teach? Uh, that I don't know. We should try to get him on. That's what I was just going to think. We should. That I would probably have like uh, a certain level of starstruckness with him more than most famous people. Yeah, I would. I would take a day off majority to. Pre- just pre- <laughs> prep for that interview. Yeah, that's an open call for Alan Taylor. Is that Matt will take a day off? Yeah. <laughs> I'm calling about basically about Cooper's relations uh, with his father. Cooper created uh, the most remarkable of self-made uh, men in American novels, Natty Bumpo, and yet Homan, fa- as found, reveals him as really an almost vicious snob. His father was, according to your own, your book, was semi-literate an exploiter of the land. Uh, the semi-literate thing is interesting. Um, no matter how successful uh, William Cooper got as a proprietor, and he founded this massive town and became the sort of go-to to settle new lands in like the St. Lawrence River Valley of very wealthy men in Philadelphia, New York, um, he always he had his, his correspondence is just riddled with spelling errors. And there's one, very, I think, rather touching letter where he writes um actually i want to read this out yeah so uh, this is from alan cooper's uh, william cooper's town or alan taylor's william cooper's town um in 1789 he apologized to a correspondent p.s thee will at all times be pleased to excuse bad spelling as i was never learnt to write nor cipher but having taken them up myself and it's interesting, like, one, there's a bunch of misspellings uh, in that um, uh, part. And it's hard to know, I guess, for my eyes, what's just a uh, modern uh, misspelling or a, a antiquated one. But um, he became a huge library patron, so he read voraciously. Um, a yeah, very interesting guy. Do we know what, what he was reading? Yeah, we they, we actually have a fairly sustained records about that. Um, let's see, do I I might have some notes on that actually. The Library Company of Burlington, the town's preeminent social club and cultural institution, played a critical role in William Cooper's ascent. Founded by weighty friends and wealthy Anglicans in 1757, the Library Company was the seventh oldest subscription library in the colonies. The charter members had included William Franklin and several members of the Smith family, the weightiest friends in Burlington. Cooper secured membership in January 1780, when he was 25 years old. That admission was a critical watershed in Cooper's life, demarking his subsequent pursuit of gentility from his previous life of hard labor and limited prospects. As a member Cooper became familiar with the town's most prestigious and best-read men, and he gained access to the worldly knowledge contained in 1,400 volumes written by the most highly approved Antian and modern authors. Worth in excess of 500 pounds, the collection was far too large and expensive for any one citizen of Burlington to own. The directors promised that the library gave young people an opportunity of becoming acquainted with the sentiments of those great men in all ages, who have been celebrated for their learning and abilities, of storing their minds with ideas, which through life may be highly serviceable to them, and it affords a rational entertainment to all. The member would not only improve the mind, but mend the heart. Beginning with his pound 3.13.0 admission fee and continuing by dues of 10 shillings a year, Cooper bought access to the books and networks necessary for his gradual reinvention as a gentleman. Virtually uneducated when he came to Burlington, Cooper used the library company as his school to cultivate the knowledge, mores, and manners of a William Franklin and a Richard Smith. The circulation records indicate that he early read, and later returned to, the preceptor, containing a general course of education, wherein the first principles of polite learning are laid down in a way most suitable for trying the genius and advancing the instruction of youth a sign that Cooper was a purposeful reader seeking a crash course in gentility. I love that. The library company's circulation records survive for Cooper's first nine years as a member, documenting his increasingly ambitious program of self-education. As a reader Cooper began slowly, checking out only six volumes in 1780, ten in 1781, and seventeen in 1782. Thereafter, he picked up the pace, withdrawing 42 volumes in 1783 more than the combined total of his first three years. 
he became the library company's most diligent reader, appearing on most Sunday afternoons, the one time in the week when the library opened. During the period 1783 to 1788 Cooper averaged 46 volumes a year. By March 7, like 1789, when well, the surviving circulation records I'll break, see. Cooper had withdrawn a total of 319 volumes a major effort for a man who began with bare literacy and who, at the same time, had to meet the increasing demands of his growing family, expanding store, and complicated land speculations. Yet no other member read so much so quickly. He must have burned a lot of midnight oil and schemed much that he checked out. Cooper was in a hurry to catch up to the well-educated gentleman who dominated the civic, economic, and cultural life of Burlington, a 1748 novel by the Scotsman Tobias Smollett, The Adventures of Roderick Random, yeah. had a special appeal to Cooper. It was one of the two books he checked out on his first day as a member, and it was the only novel that he withdrew twice, returning for it seven years later. It's amazing how much you can learn from metadata. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I, I want to, this is a bit later in this chapter, but um, I just want to read this paragraph. His selections reveal a worldly mind engaged in a conscious effort to transcend his provincial origins and outlook. Cooper sought that borderland where the imaginative and the tangible intersected where a narrator conducted the mind's eye to alien places that were ostensibly real but distant in space and time from Burlington. Preferring rich to weighty analysis, Cooper avoided anything abstract, theoretical, metaphysical, or spiritual, especially the library's extensive collection in sermons and religious commentaries. Uh, even his rare and tentative forays into the religious literature attest to the limits of his interest. Right. And... <laughs> Well, I mean, that's interesting because, I mean, at that exact time that they're like Emmanuel Kant, for example, is really cutting off like metaphysics and theology from philosophy mm. and being like it, he's like such a hyper focus, like the enlight or the Enlightenment project should be hyper focused on like tactile material reality. And it's interesting that well, uh, he, William Cooper is, is following uh, that path. Yeah, here's the kicker on that. <clears throat> Uh, twice he checked out the Bible, indicating that he did not own the u ubiquitous book of the 18th century <laughs> America. <laughs> yeah, you should probably own that book, I would imagine, in the 18th century. I'll check that out. Um, let's see if we have more. Twice is, like, is good, though, because it's like, clearly he probably was like, I can't, I can't read this. And then he's like, <laughs> oh, really? Like, maybe he, like, was at a dinner party and someone's like, you don't have the Bible? And he's like, I do, I do. I just, uh, I just forgot i it's i loaned, I loaned it, to a friend. it yeah, yeah, yeah i loaned it out to somebody he was famously famously blasphemous too um and he got in trouble for it reprimanded for it but people liked him so you know what are you gonna do yeah um actually i'll just go through it here's a here's a few other uh notes i some random notes i've written down about uh william cooper it's interesting that he's into novels at that point because novels are such a niche product. I will say um, the novels were about a tenth of his reading. So it wasn't, oh, okay. Yeah, the, the vast majority was uh, uh, like a lot of um, travel um, sort of um, yeah, that exploration makes, shit. That tracks. Um, so yeah, uh, born December 2nd, 1754, uh, died December 22nd, 1809. Uh, born outside Philly to Quakers. Uh, he would mm -hmm. end up becoming a United States representative uh, twice. Uh, first term started in 1795, and then he was reelected again later in 1799. He was also the judge of uh, Cooperstown. Um, I mean, it's named after him. He should be the judge of it. Um, and so it goes. Uh, was a storekeeper in Burlington, New Jersey in the 1780s. Um, this is like when he was doing his Burlington Library um, readings. Um, married Elizabeth Fenimore in 1774 and she had the money. Mm -hmm. Um, she came from a wealthy father now. Um, and the service was conducted by William Franklin, uh, the, oh. uh, the heir, but uh, also illegitimate son of, uh, Ben Franklin, who was nonetheless brought up, uh, to be an aristocrat by Franklin. Yeah. Ben Franklin, uh, had a penchant for French prostitutes. There you go. And, uh, but the and the funny thing about um, this marriage to Elizabeth Fenimore is that uh, people are wondering why it, it looked like it, it was a bit of a rushed marriage mm. without the parent uh, parents um, approval and, and there could be a class thing there definitely um, not making enough money mm -hmm. but why they were probably successful is there's rumors that her father was a bit of a drunk so yeah he wasn't able to uh, uh, lay the law down. Yeah, he was uh, 
blasphemous but well liked uh what was called a, a wet quaker so he wasn't super quaker heavy <laughs> wet quaker um he owned slaves. quaker who likes likes to have a beer or two like you're not supposed to be owned slaves he owned slaves that's not a good quaker yeah very bad quaker <laughs> but he did praise the anti-slavery pamphlet while he owned oh, slaves that's nice. um which is nice of him um, yeah, I had to check out the Bible. Uh, his Quakers opposed the revolution. Business was good for them, uh, but he, uh, <laughs> he he leveraged uh, he leveraged it himself. And he was a Quaker in that he didn't want to hear anyone speak when he went to uh, mass. Basically, he was a cultural Quaker. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and ooh, I'm gonna just turn this off for a little bit while I get my next note ready here. Um, here's another bit from uh, Alan Taylor's William Cooperstown is just an introduction for our novel here. Dying in late 1809, William Cooper seemed in his will to endow his children with a great fortune and social preeminence. However, their inheritance proved fatally compromised by faulty land titles and burdensome debts that, in the years 1819 to 1824, culminated in foreclosures that virtually wiped out the family fortune. As his inheritance vanished, James Fenimore Cooper, the youngest son, became a novelist, publishing his first novel in 1820 and his third, The Pioneers, in 1823.8. In The Pioneers the novelist tried to revive and reclaim his lost property and position in an imagined place, Templeton. Set in the Otsego country of the 1790s, the novel vividly evokes a frontier community in conflict over who should own its resources and who should govern the people. Richly descriptive, the Pioneers offers an intensely reimagined past as an act of reverie and repossession. In an 1850 introduction to the novel, Cooper noted, the face of the country, the climate as it was found by the whites, and the manners of the settlers, are described with a minuteness for which the author has no other apology than the force of his own recollections. The novelist indulged his pleasing memories and exorcised his painful ones.9. In particular Cooper wrestled with the contradictions and mysteries of his father's character. Impelled by powerful and difficult memories, Cooper cast his father as the novel's Judge Marmaduke Temple, the founder, developer, and ruler of the frontier village of Templeton. Judge Temple is a man of good intentions but loose scruples, of expansive vision but flawed manners, of benevolent paternalism but blundering execution. Temple falls just short of the full gentility and true self-discipline needed to maintain his authority over Templeton's fractious and greedy settlers.10. The pioneers secured James Fenimore Cooper's reputation as the first great and popular novelist in the United States and the premier literary spokesman for his generation. The novel also jogged the memory of former President John Adams, who had known William Cooper as a congressman during the 1790s. In 1824 Adams wrote to a friend in upstate New York, I understand that your New York novelist has been in Boston, and I am quite affronted with him that he did not call upon me. I knew and respected his father who was indeed one of the great pioneers. So yeah, a lot of those founding fathers uh, are peripheral to the William Cooper fa family. Um, you know, John Jay, famously, we talked about in the first episode, uh, consulted about the spy. Mm -hmm. um, and the funny thing about that is you look at how much that basically just served as cover for James Fenimore Cooper to uh, write a novel as a man and still be manly. Like, yeah. we have this war hero... Uh, vouching for it this is actually pretty true you can learn some pretty true stuff about war <laughs> yeah um by uh, reading yeah. this but yeah i know you think that this is like a dumb story but actually it's like real men doing real shit so <laughs> yes. maybe you should show some respect to the troops it reminds me of how you know um guy the guy's making fun of uh you know dolls for instance right um like girls playing with dolls mm -hmm. it's like the most famous thing um little boys make fun of girls for doing yep. meanwhile like i'm playing nba 2k deciding which uniforms i want the uh, <laughs> yeah. lakers to, to yeah, wear yeah. <laughs> like, yeah yeah i can't have them wearing clashing colors yeah exactly we, we need to <laughs> Ooh, we'll do the uh the 2000 to 2002 Detroit yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah just a taste of vintage but also it has this like hint of modern it, it, it works well together <laughs> i really miss these jerseys um okay so uh let's move on to uh, the actual story here it basically opens up with uh a sleigh uh, let's just start from the beginning Near the center of the state of New York lies an extensive district of country whose surface is a succession of hills and dales, or to speak with greater deference to geographical definitions, of mountains and valleys. It is among these hills that the Delaware takes its rise, 
and flowing from the limpid lakes and thousand springs of this region, the numerous sources of the Susquehanna meander through the valleys until, uniting their streams, they form one of the proudest rivers of the United States. The mountains are generally arable to the tops, although instances are not wanting where the sides are jutted with rocks that aid greatly in giving the country that romantic and picturesque character which it so eminently possesses. The vales are narrow, rich, and cultivated, with a stream uniformly winding through each. Beautiful and thriving villages are found interspersed among the margins of the small lakes, or situated at those points of the streams which are favorable for manufacturing, and neat and comfortable farms, with every indication of wealth about them, are scattered profusely through the vales, and even to the mountain tops. Roads diverge in every direction from the even and graceful bottoms of the valleys to the most rugged and intricate passes of the hills. Academies and minor edifices of learning meet the eye of the stranger at every few miles as he winds his way through this uneven territory and places for the worship of God abound with that frequency which characterize a moral and reflecting people, and with that variety of exterior and canonical government which flows from unfettered liberty of conscience. In short, the whole district is hourly exhibiting how much can be done. In even a rugged country with a severe climate, under the dominion of mild laws, and where every man feels a direct interest in the prosperity of a commonwealth, of which he knows himself to form a part. The expedients of the pioneers who first broke ground in the settlement of this country are succeeded by the permanent improvements of the yeoman who intends to leave his remains to molder under the sod which he tills, or perhaps of the son who, born in the land, piously wishes to linger around the grave of his father. Only forty years have passed since this territory was a wilderness. So basically, uh, we have stages of, uh, you know that stages of civilization painting? I always forget that reference. Maybe I shouldn't bring this up. Mm, There's like five different paintings, and it's it's basically like this port, uh, uh, Hellenic sort of port town. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, Course of Empire by Thomas Cole, 1833. Uh, it was painted in 1833 mm. to 1836. And basically, you have... Uh, the savage state, the Arcadian or pastoral state, the consummation of empire, destruction, and desolation. Um, and so he, we, here we have uh, the Ar uh, the Arcadian and pastoral state. We're going to move 40 years. Or no, I would say probably where this narration starts is the consummation of empire between there mm -hmm. and the Arcadian pastoral state. We're moving back closer to the uh, Arcadian or pastoral state. Um, and then obviously the savage state, uh, right off, which is the main thing about these little stocking tales is it's the passing of the savage state for good. I think what's interesting about the, uh, this book, at least compared to anything else that we've read is how much of a critical role that nature plays in the narrative Yeah, that it's constantly influencing people's decisions and choices that they make throughout the narrative being like, it's almost referenced nature itself is referenced as if it's, it is a character. And it's always like, if you're describing any kind of tactile thing or person, it's always within the context of like the nature that it resides in, which I find very unique. And so, uh, eventually he, he describes a landscape like that. And, uh, we flash back to 1793, uh, and a sleigh is moving up the mountain as well as every arrangement of the travelers denoted the depth of winter in the mountains. The harness, which was of a deep, dull black, differing from the glossy varnishing of the present day, was ornamented with enormous plates and buckles of brass that shone like gold in those transient beams of the sun, which found their way obliquely through the tops of the trees. Huge saddles, studded with nails and fitted with cloth, that served as blankets to the shoulders of the cattle, supported four high, square-topped turrets, through which the stout reins led from the mouths of the horses to the hands of the driver, who was a negro of apparently twenty years of age. His face, which nature had colored with a glistening black, was now mottled with the cold, and his large shining eyes filled with tears, a tribute to its power that the keen frost of those regions always extracted from one of his African origin. Now, uh, the thing about James Fenmar Cooper is he's very interested in race science, um, which is one of the more uncomfortable things about these novels. But 
I do have to give him props for at least representing that none of this shit gets done without slave labor, even in New York at this time, right? The, yeah. fr- the frontier is a location of exploitation of other people. Um, this is at this is at the near end of a of New York's uh, legalization of slavery, I think. Yeah, uh, basically, New York, um, they outlawed slavery, but if you were a slave, you had to w- wait till 1827 yep. um, to, le- to be totally free. Still, there was a smiling expression of good humor in his happy countenance that was created by the thoughts of home and a Christmas fireside with its Christmas frolics. The s- they do like to imply that the like slaves really love Christmas, um, <laughs> which is interesting to me. Like, yeah. Maybe a... Maybe Christmas has been used Play. for uh, some sort Make that of connection. Do it. societal control. I don't know. One of those large, comfortable, old-fashioned conveyances, which would admit a whole family within its bosom, but which now contained only two passengers besides the driver. The color of its outside was a modest green, and that of its inside, a fiery red. The latter was intended to convey the idea of heat in that cold climate. Large buffalo skins trimmed around the edges with red cloth cut into festoons covered the back of the sleigh and were spread over its bottom and drawn up around the feet of the travelers, one of whom was a man of middle age and the other a female just entering into womanhood. So basically Judge Marmaduke Temple and his daughter Elizabeth Temple and their slave Agamemnon. Uh, Now let's get to where the rubber meets the road here and uh, a deer is killed. The sleigh had glided for some distance along the even surface, and the gaze of the female was bent in inquisitive and, perhaps, timid glances into the recesses of the forest, when a loud and continued howling was heard, pealing under the long arches of the woods like the cry of a numerous pack of hounds. The instant the sounds reached the ear of the gentleman, he cried aloud to the black, Hold up, Aggie! There is old Hector! I should know his bay among ten thousand! The leather stocking has put his hounds into the hills this clear day, and they have started their game. There's a deer track a few rods ahead, and now, Bess, if thou canst muster courage enough to stand fire, I will give thee a saddle for thy Christmas dinner. The black drew up with a cheerful grin upon his chilled features, and began thrashing his arm together in order to restore the circulation of his fingers, while the speaker stood erect, and throwing aside his outer covering, stepped from the sleigh upon a bank of snow, which sustained his weight without yielding. In a few moments, this... Just note that he knew whose do- hunting dogs those were, uh, specifically, and that he was going to get in on the deer that they were chasing. And he just felt like, yeah, I'm going to get in on some of that. <laughs> Beaker succeeded in extricating a double-barreled filing piece from among a multitude of trunks and band boxes. After throwing aside the thick mittens which had encased his hands, there now appeared a pair of leather gloves tipped with fur. He examined his priming and was about to move forward when the light bounding noise of an animal plunging through the woods was heard, and a fine buck darted into the path a short distance ahead of him. The appearance of the animal was sudden, and his flight inconceivably rapid, but the traveler appeared to be too keen a sportsman to be disconcerted by either. As it came first into view, he raised the filing piece to his shoulder, and with a practiced eye and steady hand, drew the trigger. The deer dashed forward, undaunted and apparently unhurt. Without lowering his piece, the traveler turned its muzzle toward his victim and fired again. Neither discharge, however, seemed to have taken effect. The whole scene had passed with a rapidity that confused the female, who was unconsciously rejoicing in the escape of the buck. Women just don't understand hunting. No. As he rather darted like a meteor than ran across the road, when a sharp, quick sound struck her ear quite different from the full round reports of her father's gun, but still sufficiently distinct to be known as the concussion produced by firearms. At the same instant that she heard this unexpected report, the buck sprang from the snow to a great height in the air, and directly a second discharge similar to the sound of the first followed, when the animal came to the earth, failing headlong and rolling all over on the crust with its own velocity. A loud shout was given by the unseen marksman, and a couple of men instantly appeared from behind the trunks of two of the pines, where they had evidently placed themselves in expectation of the passage of the deer. Ah, Natty! Had I known you were in ambush, I should not have fired, cried the traveler, moving toward the spot where the deer lay, 
near to which he was followed by the delighted black with his sleigh. But the sound of old Hector. So that's a lie because he knew Natty was involved because he knew it was his dog. So right away, uh, the, you can tell if, if this is about James Fenimore Cooper's dad, it's not a uh, one that just uh, glorifies him. Yeah, it's miles away from like the Washington, George Washington character from The Spy. Exactly, yeah. Ha, ah, Natty, had I known you were in ambush, I should not have fired, cried the traveler, moving toward the spot where the deer lay near to which he was followed by the delighted black with his sleigh. But the sound of old Hector was too exhilarating to be quiet, though I hardly think I struck him either. No, no, judge, returned the hunter with an inward chuckle, and with that look of exultation that indicates a consciousness of superior skill. You burnt your powder only to warm your nose this cold evening. Did ye think to stop a full-grown buck with Hector and the slut, open upon him within sound, with that pop gun in your hand? There's plenty of pheasants among the swamps, and the snowbirds are flying round your own door where you may feed them with crumbs and shoot them at pleasure any day. So this is the very first uh, appearance of Natty Bumpo of Leatherstocking. Okay. And it's him uh, lecturing uh, one of his uh, class betters on how to be a better outdoorsman. Yeah, saying that you only fired the shot to what is it? Fired the powder to warm your nose. Yeah, and you That's, don't know the quite the the right gun for the right sort of game. Yeah, lovely. You fucking city slickers. But if you're for a buck or a little bear's meat, judge, you'll have to take the long rifle with a grease wadding, or you'll waste more powder than you'll fill stomachs. I'm thinking. As the speaker concluded, he drew his bare hand across the bottom of his nose and again opened his enormous mouth with a kind of inward laugh. The gun scatters well, Matty. And it's killed a deer before now, said the traveler, smiling good-humoredly. One barrel was charged with buckshot, but the other was loaded for birds only. Here are two hurts, one through the neck and the other directly through the heart. It is by no means certain, Natty, that I gave him one of the two. Let who will kill him, said the hunter rather surly. I suppose the creature is to be eaten. So saying, he drew a large knife from a leathern sheath, which was stuck through his girdle or sash, and cut the throat of the animal. If there are two balls through the deer, I would ask if there weren't two rifles fired. Besides, who ever saw such a ragged hole from a smoothbore as this through the neck? And you will own yourself, Judge, that the buck fell at the last shot, which was sent from a truer and younger hand than your or mine either. But for my part, although I am a poor man... I can live without the venison, but I don't love to give up my lawful dues in a free country, though for the matter of that, might often makes right here as well as in the old country, for what I can see. Here's a little uh, political cynicism from Natty. Yeah. Uh, might makes right here, even though we're supposedly a free country. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the country is like only a decade or so old and it's already being like like savaged with like irony and sarcasm yeah well remember this is one of the books that was a response to that who reads an american book thing where they mentioned like uh you don't need you like have slaves still why are you, yeah, you yeah. guys talking about how great your country is um and uh, it's it is interesting to uh, you know there's an irony that's later played into a joke that will will play um, that Fenimore Cooper writes, that, but like talking about a free country, well, Agamemnon, the slave, is right there. Um. An air of sullen dissatisfaction pervaded the manner of the hunter during the whole of his speech. Yet he thought it prudent to utter the close of the sentence in such an undertone as to leave nothing audible but the grumbling sounds of his voice. Nay, Natty, rejoined the traveler with undisturbed good humor. It is for the honor that I contend. A few dollars will pay for the venison, but what will requite me for the lost honor of the buck's tail in my cap? You didn't kill the deer. Yeah, didn't happen. So you don't get the honor. Yeah. This is, uh, this is uh, the capitalist purchasing merit. Yeah. Think, Natty, how I should triumph over that quizzling dog, Dick Jones, who has failed seven times already this season and has only brought in one woodchuck and few gray squirrels. Ah, the game is becoming too hard to find. Indeed, Judge. With your clearings and betterments, said the old hunter, with a kind of compelled resignation. The time was when I have shot thirteen deer without counting the fawns standing in the door of my own hut, 
and for bear's meat, if one wanted a ham or so, he had only to watch a night's, and he could shoot one by moonlight through the cracks of the logs. No fear of oversleeping himself either, for the howling of the wolves was certain to keep his eyes open. There's old Hector, panting with affection, a tall hound of black and yellow spots with white belly and legs, that just then came in on the scent, accompanied by the slut he had mentioned. See where the wolves bit his throat the night I drove them from the venison that was smoking on the chimney top? That dog is more to be trusted than many a Christian man, for he never forgets a friend and loves the hand that gives him bread. There was a peculiarity in the manner of the hunter that attracted the notice of the young female, who had been a close and interested observer of his appearance and equipments. From the moment he came into view, he was tall and so meager as to make him seem above even the six feet that he actually stood in his stockings. On his head, which was thinly covered with lank sandy hair, he wore a cap made of fox skin, resembling in shape the one we have already described, although much inferior in finish and ornaments. His face was skinny and thin, almost to emaciation, but yet it bore no signs of disease. On the contrary, it had every indication of the most robust and enduring health. The cold and exposure had, together, given a colorful uniform red. His gray eyes were glancing under a pair of shaggy brows that overhung them in long hairs of gray, mingled with their natural hue. His scraggy neck was bare, and burnt to the same tint with his face. Although a small part of a shirt collar made of the country check was to be seen above the overdress he wore. A kind of coat made of dressed deerskin, with the hair on, was belted close to his lank body by a girdle of colored worsted. On his feet were deerskin moccasins ornamented with porcupine squills, after the manner of the Indians, and his limbs were guarded with long leggings of the same material as the moccasins, which, gartering above the knees of his tarnished buckskin breeches, had obtained for him among the settlers the nickname of Leatherstocking. Over his left shoulder was slung a belt of deerskin, from which depended an enormous ox horn, so thinly scraped as to discover the powder it contained. The larger end was fitted ingeniously and securely with a wooden bottom, and the other was stopped tight by a little plug. A leathern pouch hung before him, from which, as he concluded his last speech, he took a small measure, and filling it accurately with powder, he commenced reloading the rifle, which, as its butt rested on the snow before him, reached nearly to the top of his foxskin cap. The traveler had been closely examining the wounds during these movements, and now, without heeding the ill humor of the hunter's manner, he exclaimed, I would fain establish a right, Maddy, to the honor of this death, and surely, if the hit in the neck be mine, it is enough, for the shot in the heart was unnecessary. What we call an act of supererogation, leather stocking. You may call it what learned name you please, judge, said the hunter, throwing his rifle across his left arm and knocking up a brass lid in the breech from which he took a small piece of greased leather and, wrapping a bale in it, forced them down by main strength on the powder, where he continued to pound them while speaking. It's far easier to call names than to shoot a buck on the spring, but the creature came to his end from a younger hand than either yourn or mine, as I said before. What say you, my friend? cried the traveler, turning pleasantly to Natty's companion. Shall we toss up this dollar for the honor, and you keep the silver if you lose? What say you, friend? that I killed the deer, answered the young man with a little haughtiness as he leaned on another long rifle, similar to that of Natty. You are two to one indeed, replied the judge with a smile. I am outvoted, overruled, as we say on the bench. There is Aggie. He can't vote, being a slave, and Bess is a minor. So I must even make the best of it. But you'll send me the venison and the deuces in it. But I make a good story about its death. It's interesting to me that he brings it up in a sort of a him versus democracy context immediately. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I think that, I don't know, I think it's a very revealing little part there. Well, I think that order and democracy are uh, opposed to each other in this narrative. Yeah. This meat is not mine to sell, said Leather Stocking, adopting a little of his companion's hotter. For my part, I've known animals travel for days with shots in the neck. And I'm none of them who rob a man of his rightful dues. You are tenacious of your rights this cold evening, Natty, returned the judge with unconquerable good nature. But what say you, young man? Will three dollars pay you for the buck? First, let us determine the question of right to the satisfaction of us both, 
said the youth firmly, but respectfully, and with a pronunciation and language vastly superior to his appearance. With how many shot? That's what they call foreshadowing. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, with a pronunciation and language vastly superior to his appearance. That's very reminiscent of the uh, hidden identity stuff in The Spy. Yeah. And I think that this... One of the ways I think that... Or one of the reasons that I quite enjoyed this novel is this this exchange between Natty Bumpko and the judge is that it's like a microcosm for the rest of the novel Mm -hmm. where they're trying, these two forces have uh, like a a land issue essentially has occurred. And these two forces are trying to create the terms in which there can, an agreement can be made. There is no pre, there is no law here essentially. Like there is no, you can't just point to something beyond yourself and be like, these are the rules. This is what happened. Rather, there's these like sets of rules that come in and they have to find a way, these two people to like synthesize it. Yeah. And and that, that's the whole narrative of this, of what, of what pioneer life is. That it's not, it's not the old world and it's not this new world. It's this, it's this synthesis that's being born through the dialogue between these two characters yeah and certain elements of the old world extending into the new world yeah uh and, yeah did you load your gun with five sir said the judge a little struck with the other's manner are they not enough to slay a buck like this one would do it but moving to the tree from behind which he had appeared you know sir You fired in this direction. Here are four of the bullets in the tree. The judge examined the fresh marks in the bark of the pine and shaking his head said with a laugh, You are making out the case against yourself, my young advocate. Where is the fifth? Here, said the youth, throwing aside the rough overcoat that he wore and exhibiting a hole in his undergarment through which large drops of blood were oozing. Good God, exclaimed the judge with horror. Have I been trifling here about an empty distinction and a fellow creature suffering from my hands without a murmur? But hasten, quick, get into my sleigh. It is but a mile to the village. Where surgical aid can be obtained, all shall be done at my expense, and thou shalt live with me until my thy wound is healed. I am forever afterward. So, um, the uh, man who shot there, Young, uh, later uh, identifies himself as Oliver Edwards. Um, becomes actually what looks to be the protagonist of this novel. Um, yeah. You know, like later you have... It, you it, Natty becomes sort of the uh, emergent character, uh, but it, it, it seems like if, if there's a character that maybe James Wimmer Cooper would relate to, it's Oliver here. Yeah. Well, Natty Bumpo... Uh, Bum- what is it? It's Bumpo. Bumpo. Yeah, right. Nanny Bumpo has this kind of like raw charisma of someone who can almost speak the language of nature, and he he just jumps off the page, and you can even see like in the reader's voice, he gives he gives Nanny Bumpo like a certain level of like gravitas in a way that gives a judge this kind of like perverse kind of like uh like hoity toity kind of attitude, but is it comes off as almost comical. You can just see that like. It, it may not have been the main character for this novel, but at some point Cooper was like, I need to come back <laughs> to this character. Right. I thank you for your good intention. But oh, I- wait, we don't need to go any further than that. Um, so yeah, um, Oliver Edwards eventually does go back. Uh, it, um, Elizabeth is, helps persuade him to accept their uh, help in, uh, in, in treating his wound there. Um, but there you do get one of the kind of unrealistic James Fenimer Cooper elements. Like he's there, uh, with a gunshot, uh, but like doesn't reveal it until the moment where it's like kind of funny to do so. Like there's yeah, four yeah. bullets here. Where's the fifth one? What's well, in my arm? Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a nice reveal for the character for the judge though. Is he he kind of seems just kind of like, not necessarily an asshole, but a bit litigious, and a bit of like a square, like not necessarily like he doesn't know his way around nature. Mm-hmm. He seems a little detached from reality, but once he finds out that this person that he doesn't even know has been injured, he's like, "Oh, oh, good heavens!" Like, and he, he gives him his his estate to to mend and things like that. And I think it's it 
it, it complexifies the character in a very good way. It, it does, but it, it's also like he says, am I trifling over a meaningless distinction? And it's like, dude, it's not a meaningless distinction. <laughs> you didn't shoot the fucking deer. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, that, that, but that's what I love about the character where he's like, he's willing to like open up his humanity to this injured person, but not willing to drop the trivial, yeah. like the, the trivial shit. Which is like, well, like, like, oh, I, I killed this deer and hurt this guy. Like, you didn't kill the deer, dude. You didn't even touch him. Yeah, exactly. So let's go um, to uh, chapter two, which is basically a, a, a little bit of backstory for Marmaduke Temple uh, and how he had a friend who was a loyalist and he was a, a revolutionary during the um, American Revolution and how he benefited from that. Um, and so this is how, and this is true to um, to uh, William Cooper, is that he wasn't terribly active during the revolution, but he did make a lot of money off of the result of it. It's the best of both worlds. Um, I have mentioned who was the mother of Elizabeth, and the visits of his friends were becoming more frequent. There was a speedy prospect of removing the veil from their intercourse, as its advantages became each hour more apparent to Mr. Effingham. When the tro- this is talking about uh, Effingham, uh, who uh, I, I th- pretty sure that name comes up in Last of the Mohicans. As the, um, uh, I can't remember it But yeah, it's been a while. Um, but uh, Effingham and um, the Temple, they have this discre- this uh, this business. They're, they run a mercantile house together. And uh, they want to keep it discreet because Effingham's father is basically this British general, like li- military lifer. And so he like keeps discreet from business um, uh, interests, and then um, which m- makes Effingham stay a loyalist. Uh, his son, uh, that's uh, the the partner with Temple, and what's the uh, Cooper or um, not Cooper Temple uh, sides with the revolutionaries. Troubles that preceded the War of the Revolution extended themselves to an alarming degree. Educated in the most dependent loyalty, Mister Effingham had from the commencement of the disputes between the colonist and the crown warmly maintained that he believed to be the just prerogatives of his prince while on the other hand the clear head and independent mind of temple had induced him to espouse the cause of the people both might have been influenced by early impressions for if the son of the loyal and gallant soldier bowed in implicit obedience to the will of his sovereign the descendant of the persecuted followers of penn looked back with little bitterness on the unmerited wrongs that had been heaped on his ancestors. This difference in opinion had long been a subject of an amicable dispute between them, but latterly the contest was getting to be too important to admit of a trivial discussions on the part of Marmaduke. People start losing friends over politics. Yeah, you hate to see it. Hate to see it. Whose acute discernment was already catching faint glimmerings of the important events that were in embryo. The sparks of dissension soon kindled into a blaze, and the colonies, or rather as they quickly declared themselves, the states, became a scene of strife and bloodshed for years. A short time before the Battle of Lexington, Mr. Effingham, already a widower, transmitted to Marmaduke for safekeeping all his valuable effects and papers, and left the colony without his father. The war had, however, scarcely commenced in earnest when he had reappeared in New York, wearing the livery of his king, and in short time he took the field at the head of a provincial corps. In the meantime, Marmaduke had completely committed himself in the cause, as it was then called, of the rebellion. Of course, all intercourse between the friends ceased. On the part of Colonel Effingham, it was unsought, and on that of Marmaduke, there was a cautious reserve. It soon became necessary for the latter to abandon the capital of Philadelphia but he had taken the precaution to remove the whole of his effects beyond the reach of the royal forces, including the papers of his friend also. There he continued serving his country during the struggle, in various civil capacities, and always with dignity and usefulness. While, however, he discharged his functions with credit and fidelity, Marmaduke never seemed to lose sight of his own interests, for, when the estates of the adherents of the crown fell under the hammer by the acts of confiscation, he appeared in New York and became the purchaser of extensive possessions at comparatively low prices. It is true that Marmaduke, by thus purchasing estates that had been wrestled by violence from others, 
rendered himself obnoxious to the censures of that sect, which at the same time that it discards its children from a full participation in the family union, seems ever unwilling to abandon them entirely to the world. But either his success, or the frequency of the transgression in others, soon wiped off this slight stain from his character, and although there were a few who, dissatisfied with their own fortunes, or conscious of their own demerits, would make dark hints concerning the sudden prosperity of the of the unportioned Quaker, yet his service, and possibly his wealth, soon drove the recollection of these vague conjectures from men's minds. When the war ended, and the independence of the states was acknowledged, Mr. Temple turned his attention from the pursuit of commerce, which was then fluctuating and uncertain, to the settlement of those tracts of land which he had purchased. Aided by a good deal of money, and directed by the suggestions of a strong and practical reason, his enterprise throve to a degree that the climate and rugged face of the country which he selected would seem to forbid. His property increased in a tenfold ratio, and he was already ranked among the most wealthy and important of his countrymen. To inherit this wealth, he had but one child, the daughter whom we have introduced to the reader, and whom he was now conveying from school to preside over a household that had too long wanted a mistress. When the district in which his estates lay had become sufficiently populous to be set off as a county, Mr. Temple had, according to the custom of the new settlements, been selected to fill its highest judicial station. This might make a Templar smile, but in addition to the apology of necessity, there is ever a dignity in talents and experience that is commonly sufficient in any station for the protection of its possessor, and Marmaduke, more fortunate in his native clearness of mind than the judge of King Charles, not only decided right, but was generally able to give a very good reason for it. At all times, such was the universal practice of the country, and the times, and Judge Temple, so far from ranking among the lowest of his judicial contemporaries in the courts of the new counties, felt himself, and was unanimously acknowledged to be, among the first. We shall here close this brief explanation of the history and character of some of our personages. The case of William Cooper being the successful settler of the Otsego County is one that I think illustrates one of the fundamental um, absurdities of capitalism in that you credit certain individuals with prosperity when prosperity is uh, socially constructed um, and often uh, determined by material concerns. So these lands that he settled in central New York weren't the best farmland. Um, they had were very dense with wildlife. Um, but he was settling at the time settling them at the time when Europe was undergoing revolution and famine which meant grain exports were huge money for that decade. And if you're going to start a colony, uh, uh, start a new settlement, um, being able to turn around and export grain is very, very useful, way more than any sort of um, sort of paternalism of the leading founder is. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's why ultimately w when he turns, when he tries to replicate his success as a, as a pioneer leader, uh, he's he's over cocky because ultimately, and you know it's hard to blame him, right? Like he, they're just going for it, mm -hmm. um, and it, it it brings me back to like the sort of Margaret Fuller thing and the, or the Blythedale thing, um, the utopian community, uh, Brook Farm, mm -hmm. and ultimately it was governed by the economics of it. Like yeah. how how much are they able to uh, basically? And, and you can escape the outside market, um, really, uh, even back, the, even, even, you know, 200 years ago. Yeah. Well, I mean, even Alan Taylor in that interview was willing to refer to him as a self-made man, which is like, uh, it depends on how, how willing you are to parse what self-made means. Right. But basically it, didn't come from aristocracy. Yes. Yeah. It's and, true. and jumped at the opportunity that that there was to make money. But yeah, and, and part of that opportunity is you can buy labor in the form of slaves, whether yeah. they're black slaves or uh, there's also non-black slaves, uh, servant slaves in um, 
in this book as well. Yeah. I, I think sometimes it, it, like self-made can have this like metaphysical quality. It's like literally making something from nothing. And I think yeah. that's where like the argument uh, arises where it's like, well, no, it just took advantage of an opportunity that was given via like lar or macro market forces. Right. So, uh, the next chapter, uh, Marmaduke uh, Temple and Elizabeth and uh, Oliver Edwards are riding the sleigh back to help him, uh, you know, th- you know, treat the wound. Yep. Um, Marmaduke is like, am I going crazy or do I recognize you, you aristocrat seeming well-educated person that I seem to remember? Anyway, he doesn't figure out who he is at that point. Um, there's a steep hill uh, they're going around. Uh we, it goes into the judge's mansion. It's built by Richard Jones. Um, uh, the mansion is fascinating, the way it's described. Yeah. Uh, it, the the narration is it, it shows this constant flux between new and old and the synthesis between the two. Like, lines like, um, when describing the house, he said... Uh, Together, they had not only erected a dwelling for Marmaduke, but they had they had given a fashion to the architecture of the whole country. The composite order, Mister Doolittle, Doolittle would contend, was an order composed of many others and was intended to be the most useful of all, for it admitted into the construction such alterations as convenience or circumstance might require. Yeah, and that's such a that's such a a beautiful little soliloquy for. What the what? How Cooper sees the American project at this moment, and I, and I think maybe one of the more accurate representations of what the American story is, which is not necessarily some vision come whole cloth from an Enlightenment thinker so much, as the series of negotiations between people that are trying to find the most optimal way possible for them all to live. Yeah, and it's also funny how when they discuss the making of the roof on the mansion, mm-hmm. they tried to make it very uh, uh, minimal, so like you would almost yeah. not even see it, but they accidentally made it huge, and <laughs> yeah. then they decided to put some cladding on it and decided to paint it yellow. And ultimately, like they, Richard Jones and uh, I forget was it Squire Doolittle or whoever the other yeah, Doolittle, uh, architect yeah. is. Um, they represent Yankees, by the way. These are Yan- the um, Cooper settled uh, Cooperstown with Yankees. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe get into that later, but oh, but then those the two architects learned to love their creation, and not only did they love it, they. Uh, it becomes a model for mansions across yeah. the uh, country, which is very funny because uh, it shows that kind of like the 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 um the herd mentality of even the upper levels of uh, of bourgeois who can create mansions, right? Yeah, and it is true that um the the mansion that uh William Cooper made for his family in Cooperstown was modeled after another uh, mansion in uh, in the uh, I think the United Kingdom. Oh really? Yeah. Well I like there's a, there's a, at least a couple references to these pop this line of poplar trees imported from the old world that that like will they take or will they not to the soil and like well they 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 have taken but they they happen to like uh, uh, interact with the the native foliage quite well and it's like it's very good. It's very nice. Um, so we're going to go now to chapter four, which is uh, basically there's a sleigh full of other uh, 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 Lacroix. Uh, he's a Martinique, actually. <laughs> Monsieur Lacroix, uh, Major Hartman, uh, Richard Jones, and then Grant, the uh, uh, priest or preacher, are in a sleigh. And uh, basically, Monsieur Lacroix, uh, to go over him, he's a Martinique refugee re- taking refuge from the French Revolution. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, and he's also the store, a store owner in uh, Cooperstown, and I think he is based on a real life person who uh, aristocrat, or not aristocrat, but a, a quote unquote planter. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much of these planters were doing much of the planting in the yeah. West Indies at this point themselves, yeah. um, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, he, he he actually decides to work for his uh, living and decides to run a store, um, and. Uh, there's like an old uh, Hessian, uh, Major Hartman, um, who is a uh, Revolutionary War vet. Um, they're in the sleigh, and it almost basically goes off the side of a mountain until Oliver Edwards, uh, gunshot wound and all, jumps in and saves the day. And uh, here they, uh, 
as as they're recovering from uh, this near, you know, falling off a cliff, uh, the judge brings up, he starts doing his bullshit about the deer carcass again. Yeah. A few large scratches that he had received in forcing his head through the crust and the look of compliance that seemed natural to his pliable features. Ah, oh, Monsieur, Mr. Dick, what you do next? There be nothing you no try. The next thing I trust. Richard Dick was the person who failed at uh, driving the sleigh. We'll be to learn to drive, said the judge, who had busied himself in throwing the buck together with several other articles of baggage from his own sleigh into the snow. Here are seats for you all, gentlemen. The evening grows piercingly cold, and the hour approaches for the service of Mr. Grunt. We will leave friend Jones to repair the damages with the assistance of a gomenon and hasten to a warm fire. That's supposed to be with the services with the services of Agamemnon, the slave. Here, Dickon, are a few articles of best trumpery that you can throw into your sleigh when ready. And there is also a deer of my taking that I will thank you to bring. A deer of my taking? Aggie, remember that there will be a visit from Santa Claus tonight. So immediately after he says the deer is of his, ta- his taking, he goes to the witness, his slave, and says, Aggie, remember it's Christmas. Okay, buddy? Let's, uh, let's, let's, uh, let me take credit for the killing this deer. And there is also a deer of my taking that I will thank you to bring. Aggie, remember that there will be a visit from Santa Claus tonight. Footnote. The periodic visits of St. Nicholas, or Santa Claus as he is termed, were never forgotten among the inhabitants of New York. It's weird to hear Christmas described. It's, it's, yeah, note. it's very early in in like the what we now consider the yeah. the tradition of of Christmas and Santa Claus. Until the immigration from New England brought in the opinions and usages of the Puritans, like the Bon Homme de Noel, he arrives at each Christmas. End footnote. The black grinned, conscious of the bribe that was offered him for silence on the subject of the deer, while Richard, without in the least waiting for the termination of his cousin speak began his reply. Learn to dry, sayest thou, cousin Duke. Is there a man in the country who knows more of horse flesh than myself? Who broke in the filly that no one else dare mount? Though your coachman did pretend that he would have tamed her before I took her in hand. But anybody could see that he lied. He he was a great liar. That, John, what's, what's that? A buck? Richard abandoned the horses and ran to the spot where Marmaduke had thrown the deer. It's a buck. I am amazed. Yes, there are two holes in him. He has fired both barrels and hit him each time. E God, how Marmaduke will brag. He is a prodigious bragger about any small matter like this. Now, well, to think that Duke has killed a buck before Christmas. There will be no such thing as living with him. They are both bad shots, though. Mere chance, mere chance now. I never fired twice at a cloven foot in my life. It is hit or miss with me. Dead or run away. Had it been a bear or a wildcat, a man might have wanted both barrels. Here, you Aggie, how far off was the judge when this buck was shot? So he asked the slave to uh, Ag- Agamemnon to corroborate the story here. Oh, Massa, Richard, maybe a ten rod, cried the black, bending under one of the horses with the pretense of fastening a buckle, but in reality to conceal the grin that had opened a mouth from ear to ear. Ten rod? Ec- as with Washington Irving, uh, James Fenimore Cooper loves to describe how big grins are of black people. Yeah. Well, it's, the character, ref- I mean, essentially refers to him like he's a child. Yeah. And the narrator is like like one step away from that. Not necessarily as, doesn't like infantilize him as much, but it's not far off. Yeah. And uh, I would note that, uh, well, let's should we take a little bit of break and go into William Cooper's politics. Sure. Uh, here's a little bit from uh, the C-SPAN, uh, the C-SPAN um, segment we were listening to earlier. And um, also in this uh, video is uh, Professor Barbara Mann, who has some insanely hot takes that we'll get into maybe in the next uh, Pioneers episode Scorching. in the part two, which I super love. But here's she, here, her and Alan Taylor are talking about uh, James's politics. My point is, I believe 
the the English here when I tell was you what I think we've got a lot of material to work with here I mean that quotation from the Declaration of Independence was very helpful I think it, it applies directly to what we're talking well, yeah, about it's Dr. A Mann. real example of stereotypes uh, what he was talking about there was first of all in 1772 Britain outlawed slavery and it was uh, to be outlawed in all its colonies and they they followed out in 1830 was an absolute no slavery anywhere that's British. Now in 1772 America was very much a slave kind of a country and there were an awful lot of people who were quite disturbed to think that Britain might force them to uh, release their slaves. That's what he meant by inciting domestic uh, rebellion, I think the term was. Uh, when he's talking about the Native Americans, he's talking about the Iroquois League who were uh, allied with Britain. They were not minions of Britain. They were defending uh, their own territory, which included Western New York, Pennsylvania, most of Ohio. Uh, and bringing them on for savage warfare was actually uh, scare talk in the uh, frontier, especially Virginians tended to, to that scare talk about Native Americans. And interestingly enough, elsewhere, Jefferson is not so nasty about natives. Uh, he was writing this to incite rebellion against England. Um, what he meant was the uh, Iroquois League was going to be in it with Britain against uh, the colonists uh, and uh, therefore he was demonizing Native America. Alan Taylor, uh, did James Fenmore Cooper own slaves? Yes, he did. Uh, slavery remained legal in New York State until 1827. And so he grew up in a family that possessed usually three slaves, and as an adult, he um, certainly owned a slave or two. And how does that, how did he rationalize that in his own life, given what we're hearing about what he wrote in his novels? Well, he certainly considered himself a benign slaveholder, and he was holding slaves as domestic servants, and uh, they, they certainly did become free. Um, and they were probably, it would be fairer to say that they were in a state that was somewhere between slavery and freedom uh, during the 1820s because it was known that all slaves in New York were going to become free at that point and uh, the system of bondage had loosened considerably by that time. Mm -hmm. uh, he did oppose abolition and on a number of occasions in public addresses uh, engaged in debates with abolitionists uh, in that he did not think this was a good idea for the country. So, yeah, the, uh, and the interesting thing is we talked a little bit about how William Cooper was a self-made man, quote unquote, mm -hmm. but he, the weird thing about Cooper is once he started getting political, he always wanted to be a federalist, even when the more democratic, like, uh, sort of, um, uh, polit politicizing, like, um, populist, uh, politics were coming into fashion. He could have went that way and yeah. been like a George Clinton type. Um, but yeah. he, he always wanted to be an aristocrat, even though he couldn't like spell. Well, I think that there was, especially in America at that time, but the, the idea of like, of higher learning and federalism were, were wed at that moment that that populist democracy impulse, especially in the backlash of like the Napoleonic Wars that would have been happening in the early 19th century, this idea that you are a refined individual who can write novels and also happen to be a Republican was almost unheard of. Yeah. Uh, so let's go back to this um, part in chapter four. Why, Aggie, the deer I killed last winter was at 20. Yes. If anything, it was near 30 than 20. I wouldn't shoot a deer at 10 rod. Besides, you may remember, Aggie, I only fired once. Yes, Master Richard, I remember him. Natty Bumpo fired the other gun. You know, sir, all the folks say Natty kill him. You tough folks lie, you black devil, exclaimed Richard in great heat. I have not shot a gray squirrel for these four years to which that old rascal has not laid claim, or someone else or him. This is a damned envious world that we live in. People are always for dividing the credit of a thing in order to bring down merit to their own level. Now they have a story about the patent that Hiram Doolittle helped plan the steeple to St. Paul's. When Hiram knows that it is entirely mine, a little taken from a print of his namesake in London I own, but essentially, as to all points of genius, my own. I don't know where he came from, said the black, losing every mark of humor in the expression of admiration. But everybody say he wonderful handsome. And well they may say so, Aggie, cried Richard, leaving the buck and walking up to the negro with the air of a man who has new interest awakening in him. I think I may say, without bragging, that it is the handsomest and the most scientific country church in America. I know that the Connecticut settlers talk about their West Herfield meeting house, 
but I never believe more than half what they say. They are such unconscionable braggers. Just as you have got a thing done, if they see it, like... I don't know what it is about Richard that makes him so sensitive to bragging. Like, yeah, get over it, man. We, well, he's, he's a very, like, he's kind of obsessed with fairness in a way that's like, I have to be pleased first. He has a very juvenile sense of fairness, and I guess... You know, in the way that it's like, you know, nothing alien can disgust you, only things that you see in yourself. I think he's just a massive level of projection going on. They're always for interfering. And then it's tea to one, but they lay claim to half, or even all of the credit. You may remember, Aggie, when I painted the sign of the bold dragoon for Captain Hollister. There was that fellow who was about town laying brick dust on the horses. Came one day and offered to mix what I call the streaky black for the tail and mane. And then, because it looks like horsehair, he tells everybody that the sign was painted by himself and Squire Jones. If Marmaduke don't send that fellow off the patent, he may ornament his village with his own hands for me. Here, Richard paused a moment and cleared his throat by a loud hem, while the Negro, who was all this time busily engaged in preparing the sleigh, proceeded with his work in respectful silence. So I think I detect a bit of a joke there, which is that Richard realizes the, how ludicrous it is that he's complaining about, uh, exploited, uh, exploited and alienated labor and work, uh, to a slave. Yeah. Um, like look at all this stuff. I don't get credit for. Well, I think that self, oh. that self consciousness is always present. Uh, more so maybe than in a lot of literature that we've read at this time. Mm -hmm. Like the idea that the judge is like, I shot him right, right? Like there's, it's not just that he's exploiting his slave's servile condition. It's that the author knows it and expects the reader also to know that like this, he looks ridiculous because of this exchange. Right. To the religious scruples of the judge, Aggie was the servant of Richard, who had his service for a time and who, of course, commanded a legal claim to the respect of the young Negro. Footnote. The manumission of the slaves in New York has been gradual. When public opinion became strong in their favor, there grew up a custom of buying the services of slaves for six or eight years, with a condition to liberate him at the end of the period. Then the law provided that all born after a certain day should be free, the males at 28 and the females at 25. After this, the owner was obliged to cause the servants in part to read and write before they reached the age of 18. And finally, the few that remained were all unconditionally liberated in 1826, or after the publication of this tale. It was quite unusual for men more or less connected with the Quakers, who have never held slaves to adopt the first expedient. Uh, but not William Cooper. <laughs> End footnote. But when any dispute between his lawful and his real master occurred, the black felt too much deference for both to express any opinion. In the meanwhile, Richard continued watching the Negro as he fastened buckle after buckle, until, stealing a look of consciousness toward the other, he continued... Now, if that young man who was in your sleigh is a real Connecticut settler, he will be telling everybody how he saved my horses. When if he had just let them alone for half a minute longer, I would have brought them in much better, without upsetting with the whip and the mid rain it spoils a horses to give him his heel. Yeah, so Rich is still salty that he had to have, be bailed out of, uh, of driving the sleigh, and then he eventually gets it out of Agamemnon that... Oliver uh, was the one who uh, shot the deer. Um, then we move on to chapter five, where they arrive at the mansion. That's a um, uh, we meet remarkable Pettibone and Ben Pump, two different uh, Ben Pump, the uh, merry like the seafaring cook, basically, and a remarkable Pettibone. She's uh, she's it's it, she's very interesting because she is pissed off that she's a servant. Yeah. Uh, and she wants her freedom bad. And uh, um, I, I think she's Irish, but I can't. No, Pettibone, what is she? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's specific. Maybe we'll bring that up on uh, part two. Um, uh, it describes the inside of the house. Uh, the Marmaduke has a, sh a Shakespeare bust and a few others. Um, <laughs> they come back to the house and basically. Marmaduke and Elizabeth feel sad because the ma mother is missing. She's deceased. Yeah. Um, he has a Shakespeare bust and a George Washington bust, right? Oh, is that? Yeah, I think that sounds Maybe right. not a bust, but he has, he has some sort of totem for George Washington. Um, and there's this, it's also weird when they come home and like all the servants are there waiting for them in the entryway. And like, <laughs> it, 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 
It reminds me of those videos people make of their pets, like greeting them when they've been gone. <laughs> like it's very, very weird. Um, and uh, and then Richard Jones makes fun of Marmaduke f- because he finds out that Natty killed the de- the deer. Chapter six is about Doctor L. Nathan Todd. Um, now. Th- he is, uh, I don't want to go too much into the doctor thing, but it's just interesting to note another parallel with the spy because that had uh, the sit greaves, I think, was the doctor. And he was kind of like, um, he, he had another, a comical doctor right, yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, this kind of like how, I, yeah, you describe this doctor as this kind of like he is educated enough to solve the problem, but he has this like vein streak where he has to like, like overindulge like how bad it is so he can look even like better and he he has this like actor quality to him where he, he's like i want to make sure that i'm playing to an audience there's also actually i just want to play very briefly this part where um el nathan todd has a um, some uh, ethics regarding experimentation on vagrants that i think maybe haven't aged super well the doctor in templeton in New York State. If Templar would smile at the qualifications of Marmaduke to fill the judicial seat he occupied, we were certain that a graduate of Leyden or Edinburgh would be extremely amused with this true narration of the servitude of Elnathan in the temple of Escalapius. But the same consolation was afforded to both the jurist and the leech, for Dr. Todd was quite as much on a level with his own peers of the profession in that country as was Marmaduke, with his brethren on the bench. Time and practice did wonders for the physician. He was naturally humane, but possessed no small share of moral courage, or in other words... Now, here's where he describes what moral courage is. (laughs) He was chary of the lives of his patients, and never tried uncertain experiments on such members of society as were considered useful. But once or twice, when a luckless vagrant had come under his care. He was a little addicted to trying the effects of every vial in his saddlebag on the stranger's <laughs> condition. Happily, their number was small, and in most cases, their nature's innocent. By these most means, cases. Elnathan had acquired a certain degree of knowledge in fevers and aches, and could talk with judgment concerning intermittence, remittance, tertians, quotidians, etc. I mean, what are vagrants for? A little, just... Just a little addicted. <laughs> he uh, just, it's like, it's, you know, when you have like, you have a donut and you're like, oh, I should have one more. That's what this guy feels like. But when he sees someone who he had, they have no ties to uh, the town, like, oh, I could, I could kill him. I, I could use these tinctures on this guy. Yeah, see love, what they do. Yeah. I wonder if he could call, cure the common cold by cutting their nose off. Turns out you can't. And that's moral courage. Um. Now uh, we go to chapter seven. Uh, we get some uh, a history, local history of the uh, Indian tribes around there. Um, you know, I realized basically the chapter where uh, Oliver is like, "By the way, you shot me." Mm-hmm. Marmaduke Temple is the first Dick Cheney. <laughs> in American politics, so he made him apologize to, and to kill. Yeah, you, like. <laughs> It doesn't quite make him apologize, but uh, he does try to still get the deer from him. If Cheney was like, that's my grouse. Yeah. Um, I think there's probably some overlap between the judge and Dick Cheney. I think Cheney's more of a sociopath, but... Hmm. Um, Another but, friend of the pod. I yeah, hope, I, hope to get him on. And I don't think Liz Cheney's going to write any novels anytime soon. No. Um, but uh, the uh, the deer conflict gets renewed uh, after this is after they fixed uh, Oliver's arm. Is admirably dressed. You will soon be well again. Though the jerk you gave my leaders must have a tendency to inflame the shoulder, yet you will do. You will do. You were rather flurried, I s- suppose, and not used to horses. But I forgive the accident for the motive. No doubt you had the best of motives. Yes. Now you will do. Then, gentlemen, said the wounded stranger, rising and resuming his clothes, it will be unnecessary for me to trespass longer on your time and patience. There remains but one thing more to be settled, and that is our respectful rights to the deer, Judge Temple. 
I acknowledge it to be thine, said Marmaduke, and much more deeply am I indebted to thee than for this piece of venison. But in the morning thou wilt call here, and we can adjust this as well as more important matters. Elizabeth, for the young lady being apprised that the wound was dressed had re-entered the hall, thou wilt order a repast for this youth before we proceed to the church, and Aggie will have a sleigh prepared to convey him to his friend. But, sir, I cannot go without a part of the deer, returned the youth, seemingly struggling with his own feelings. I have already told you that I needed the venison for myself. Oh, we will not be particular, exclaimed Richard. The judge will pay you in the morning for the whole deer, and, remarkable, give the lad all the animal excepting the saddle. So, on the whole, I think you may consider yourself as a very lucky young man. You have been shot without being disabled. Accepting the saddle. So he still wants the part that he promised his slave. Mm -hmm. um, There's an interesting like miscommunication going on between these two different economies that are running into each other where the, the Marmaduke, is, his, his entire economy is based on credit, mm -hmm. which is like this, this is a, a monetary issue that can be solved at a later date. And you have like my, my guarantor, basically my, my promise that it'll be solved. Whereas Oliver is, he's a, he's someone who's living on, he's a subsist, a subsistence hunter. Mm -hmm. He's like, I'm hunting literally to eat possibly today. So this idea that I could have on credit, like the money for the for the deer that I killed, is of no value to him. Right. He literally needs the meat, possibly tonight. Mm -hmm. Got mouths to feed or a mouth to feed. Have had the wound dressed in the best possible manner here in the woods, as well as it would have been done in the Philadelphia hospital, if not better. Have sold your deer at a high price, and yet can keep most of the carcass with the skin in the bargain. Marky? Tell Tom to give him the skin, too, and in the morning bring the skin to me, and I will give you half a dollar for it, or at least three and sixpence. I want just the skin to cover the pillion that I am making for Cousin Bess. I thank you, sir, for your liberality, and I trust am also thankful for my escape, returned the stranger. But you reserve the very part of the animal that I wished for my own use. I must have the saddle myself. Must? echoed Richard. Must is harder to be swallowed than the horns of the buck. Yes, must, repeated the youth, when turning his head proudly around him, as if to see who would dare to controvert his rights, he met the astonished gaze of Elizabeth, and proceeded more mildly. This is the second time they've been arguing, and then Elizabeth is, Elizabeth's presence has softened uh, Oliver's approach, which is, I think, that is a frontier pattern too, yeah. right? Like the frontier is often mainly settled by men, um, and then the negotiate, and then those the the habits, the the, the brutal or um, roughness of that is negotiated over time as more women start filtering into the uh, frontier area. Yeah, the, like the sphere of influence is like, like overriding spheres of influence. And, and I feel like, especially in literature at this time, that the women's sphere of domesticity is like, this is like once it's it's a way of smoothing out conflict, like that's the woman's prerogative, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah. He met the astonished gaze of Elizabeth and proceeded more mildly. That is, if a man is allowed the possession of of that which his hand hath killed, and the law will protect him in the enjoyment of his own. The law will do so, said Judge Temple, with an air of mortification mingled with surprise. Benjamin, see that the whole deer is placed in the sleigh, and have this youth conveyed to the hut of Leatherstocking. But, young man, thou hast a name, and shall I see you again in order to compensate thee for the wrong I have done thee? I am called Edwards, returned the hunter. Oliver Edwards, I am easily to be seen, sir, for I live nigh by, and am not afraid to show my face, having never injured any man. It is we who have injured you, sir, said Elizabeth, and the knowledge that you decline our assistance would give my father great pain. He would gladly see you in the morning. The young hunter gazed at the fair speaker until his earnest look brought blood to her temples, when... Recollecting himself, he bent his head, dropping his eyes to the carpet, and replied, In the morning, then, will I return and see Judge Temple, and I will accept his offer of the sleigh in token of amity. Amity! 
repeated Marmaduke. There was no malice in the act that... Marmaduke can't let the terms be defined by uh, Oliver either. Yeah. It reminds me of there's like a there's like a whole host of videos online of like you know, people like starting fights online. This is like cla- this is like classic like pre social media like YouTube just like someone starting shit and it's just it's it all comes down to your ability to like either heighten tension or release tension. Yeah. Be like all right, all right, and some people just cannot let it go. Like some people can't see a cliff and like I gotta fucking jump off that. Right. Injured the young man. There should there was no malice in the act that injured the young man. There should be none in the feelings which it may engender. Forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, observed Mr. Grant. It is the length. Thanks, the preacher, yeah, coming yeah. to the defense of the judge there. Yeah, there's a guy who's, that's this definitely coming from someone who's the son of someone who's checked out the Bible twice. <laughs> which used by our divine master himself. And it should be the golden rule with us, his humble followers. The stranger stood a moment, lost in thought, and then... Glancing his dark eyes rather wildly around the hall, he bowed low to the divine and moved from the apartment with an air that would not admit of detention. "'Tis strange that one so young should harbor such feeling of resentment," said Marmaduke, when the door closed behind the stranger. "'But while the pain is recent and the sense of the injury so fresh, he must feel more strongly than in cooler moments. I doubt not we shall see him in the morning more tractable." Elizabeth, to whom this speech was addressed, did not reply but moved slowly up the hall by herself, fixing her eyes on the little figure of the English ingrain carpet that covered the floor, while on the other hand, Richard gave a loud crack with his whip as the stranger disappeared and cried, Well, Duke, you are your own master, but I would have tried law for the saddle before I would have given it to the fellow. Do you not own the mountains as well as the valleys? Are not... Here's where we get into strong enclosure-related... Uh issues and uh, it reminds me of i mean we were talking a bit earlier there's a, a few sections from Karl marx that are, are relevant um including a 1842 uh article written in the rheinische zeitung uh, uh debates on the law on thefts of wood um and we'll maybe get a little bit of that in the next section the woods your own what right has this chap or the leather stocking to shoot in your woods without your permission. Now, I have known a farmer in Pennsylvania order a sportsman off his farm with as little ceremony as I would order Benjamin to put a log in the stove by the by. Benjamin, see how the thermometer stands? Now, if a man has a right to do this on a farm of a hundred acres, what power must a landlord have who owns 60,000? I, for the matter of that, including the late purchases, a hundred thousand. There is Mohican, to be sure. He may have some right being a native. But it's little. The- uh, John Mohegan, or Indian John, as they call him, uh, um, or uh, a Chingachgook, uh, um, is who they're referring to. He's he's a recurring character in these leather stocking novels. Uh, Natty's friend, basically. Poor fellow can do now with his rifle. How is this managed in France, Monsieur Lacoy? Do you let everybody run over your land in that country, helter skelter, as they do here, shooting the game so that a gentleman has but little or no chance with his gun? Bah, diable, no, Mr. Dick, replied the Frenchman. We give in France no liberty except through the laddie. Yes, yes, to the woman, I know, said Richard. That is your Salic law. I read, sir, all kinds of books of France, as well as England, of Greece, as well as Rome. But if I were in Duke's place, I would stick up advertisements tomorrow morning forbidding all persons to shoot or trespass in any manner on my woods. I could write such an advertisement myself in an hour as would put a stop to the thing at once. Now, I don't know that James Fenimore Cooper shares this opinion, but that uh, expression he did, uh, I'd put up signs around my woods, that idea is, I think, um, cancerous to society. These are my woods. Yeah. Um, and this is a new, con- I mean, you touched on it before. Right. This is a new concept and a, and a very vocal or a very volatile touch point yeah. for the average citizen at this point. Yep. And this is, this is the stage setting, this uh, enclosing of the commons, basically, or privatizing of the commons yeah. uh, that sets the stage for private capitalism, basically. Yeah. And the idea that, like, 
Um, and and we d- frankly did not feel this as uh, as much as people in Europe did, for instance, where it was like all of a sudden it's like everything's like like Marx, right? Like we can, I can't go get firewood yeah. because someone owns these. Like my ancestors have been taking firewood from this forest forever. Yeah, um, you have to yeah you have to imagine an entire class of people that are essentially on like subsistence living that go to these common lands and are either hunting or gathering firewood. For them and their family for that night, not too dissimilar from what Oliver needs to do for this deer. Yep. And then you see this like massive growth in capital and property in, in 19th century Europe. An and extension all of, a of you, like the technology of the law. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All of a sudden this law can be implemented in a much yep. more aggressive way. And all of a sudden that the, this land that, yeah, like you were saying, you went on for you and your family went on for centuries is now private property. Mm-hmm. And America has this pressure release valve where it happens to have millions upon millions of acres to the west of it that they can keep just sending people out so you don't have this friction but and that's why for instance after a moment of massive uh, social turmoil the uh the um the the homestead act was created yeah but as greg grandin brilliantly pointed out that that is over and now it's all about enclosure with like the yeah. wall and different imagery. Well, a great granted, but also a uh, Frederick uh, Jackson Turner, I think is his name who had the end of the frontier back in a uh, hundred years ago. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's definitely now basically that was the end of the frontier and now we've just ended the myth about the frontier. Yeah. It's, it's finally entered the American consciousness that it's closed, that it's closed and that we're here and we better, it, we're going to need to frankly, redistribute yeah well yeah but there's two yeah there's redistribute or it's like it's for us and for no one else and by us it's white male people yeah myself in an hour as would put a stop to the thing at once Rickert said major hartman very coolly knocking the ashes from his pipe into the spitting box by his side now listen i have lived 75 years on to merhawk and into woods you had better meadow as meet the devil as meet their hunters. They leave meet their gun, and a rifle is better as to law. Ain't Marmaduke a judge? said Richard indignantly. Where is the use of being a judge or having a judge if there is no law? Damn the fellow! I have a great mind to sue him in the morning myself before Squire Doolittle for meddling with my leers. I am not afraid of his rifle. I can shoot too. I have hit a dollar many a time at fifty rods. Thou hast missed more dollars than ever thou hast hit, Dickon, exclaimed the cheerful voice of the judge. And, uh, yeah, that that was Fritz uh, Hartman chime in with that, uh, you need to be afraid of Mohawk Indians and have your gun at your side, and guns are better than law anyway, um, which is, a, you know, that, that, to trace that sentiment from, like, a, <laughs> a Hessian uh, veteran of the uh-huh. American Revolution to now is... Yeah. Yeah, one could say you could draw a direct line. <laughs> um, chapter 7 continued. Um, basically, Mr. Grant, the preacher, uh, it really wants to save John Mohegan's soul and like tries to make sure he's doing Jesus the right way. Um, uh, chapter 8, uh, we hear more a little bit about Monsieur Lacroix, uh, you know, escaping his West Indian plantation. Um and how he opened a store uh, with a bunch of knickknacks like glasses. And you know what a Jew's harp is? It's like a small instrument, right? Yeah. Like, uh, it's not something you put in your mouth, is it? I think it is. I'll, I'm going to pull up the sound of it here. Because this is another one of our uh, ancient uh, entertainments. Oh, yeah, yeah. Jew's harp, exclamation and point. And he uh, played a tune on the Jew's harp. And I thought I'd just give you a, a real big change of pace here and play you a tune on the Jews heart. So pretty cool. Yeah, just just imagining the frontier as like different levels of Skrillex rays. <laughs> yeah, the, the Jews harp drop. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, so, uh, but I want to move on quickly to uh, chapter nine, where we get into uh, the judge's uh, sugar maple. He has he has sort of a PTSD about these sugar maple trees. Yeah. And uh, that is rooted in the actual history of William Cooper, so let's move to that quickly. 
The apartment to which Monsieur Le Coy handed Elizabeth communicated with the hall through the door that led under the urn, which was supposed to contain the ashes of Dido. The room was spacious and of very just proportions, but in its ornaments and furniture the same delivery of taste and imperfection of execution were to be observed as existed in the hall. Of furniture there were a dozen green wooden armchairs with cushions of marine taken from the same piece as the petticoat of Remarkable. The tables were spread, and their materials and workmanship could not be seen, but they were heavy and of great size. An enormous mirror in a gilt frame hung against the wall, and a cheerful fire of the hard or sugar maple was burning on the hearth. The latter was the first object that struck the attention of the judge, who on beholding it exclaimed rather angrily to Richard, How often I have forbidden the use of sugar maple in my dwelling! The sight of that sap as it exudes with the heat is painful to me, Richard. Really, it behooves the owner of wood so extensive as mine to be cautious what example he sets his people, who are already felling the forest as if no end could be found to their treasures, nor any limits to their extent. If we go on in this way, twenty years hence we shall want fuel. Fuel in these hills, cousin Duke? exclaimed Richard in derision. Fuel? Why, you might as well predict that the fish will die for the want of water in the lake, because I intend, when the frost gets out of the ground, to lead one or two of the spring through logs into the village. But you are always a little wild on such subject, Marmaduke. It's a wilderness. Like a bit of climate change denial here uh, by <laughs> Richard, and uh, uh, peak oil paranoia by uh, uh, Marmaduke Temple. But you are always a little wild on such subject, Marmaduke. It's a wilderness returned Judge earnestly, to condemn a practice which devotes these jewels of the forest, these precious gifts of nature, these mines of corn, I fort and wealth, to the common uses of a fireplace. But I must and will, the instant the snow is off the earth, send out a party into the mountains to explore for coal. Coal! echoed Richard. Who the devil do you think would dig for coal? When hunting for a bushel, he would have to rip up more of trees than would keep him in fuel for a twelve-month. Ha! Ha! Marmaduke, you should leave the management of these things to me, who have a natural turn that way. It was I that ordered this fire, and a noble one it is, to warm the blood of my pretty cousin Bess. The motive, then, must be your apology, Dick Lawn, said the judge. But, gentlemen, we are waiting. Elizabeth, my child, take the head of the table. Richard, I see, means to spare me the trouble of carving by sitting opposite to you. Uh, so, yeah, it turns out that maple trees were a huge uh, part of William Cooper's uh, attempt at uh, settling this land, and we have some more from William Cooper's town uh, on this. Men and boys during a three- to six-week period at the end of winter and beginning of spring, March and April, when warm days alternate with frosty nights to keep the sap in circulation. A settler's son recalled, the tapping of the trees, the regular rounds made to empty the vessels, the filling of the kettles, the keeping up of the fire, the watching of the process as the transparent sap first changed into syrup, and then into sugar, and all this in the woods, fast budding into life and beauty, formed an annual festival scene whose coming we anticipated with joy 13. Initially, Otsego's Yankee families produced maple sugar in modest quantities strictly for household consumption. It seemed that maple sugar could not compete in urban and foreign markets with the whiter, purer sugar produced from canes grown on slave plantations in the West Indies. But William Cooper became convinced that maple sugar could be refined and mass-produced to compete in both quality and quantity with cane sugar. Cooper considered maple sugar the ideal commodity for new settlers because its production required little labor and less capital. Simply by tapping existing trees, settlers could produce maple sugar immediately, without clearing the old forest to cultivate new plants. Properly done, tapping neither damaged nor killed a tree, permitting a sustained harvest year after year. Because March was a slack season for farming, the increased production of maple sugar mobilized underemployed labor instead of sacrificing some other enterprise. Because the capital necessary was limited to a kettle, a ladle, a few pails, troughs, and molds, the production could be decentralized among many farm families drawing upon their own labor working their own land. Cooper subsidized, in, Cooper subsidized those uh, materials as well. Many farm families drawing upon their own labor working their own land. Boys old enough to carry a pail, or to feed a fire with light fuel could do most of the work. Point fifteen. Cooper concluded that maple sugar was the key commodity that would unlock the full economic potential of the northern upcountry to the benefit of consumers, settlers, landlords, and even West Indian slaves. He set out to persuade his countrymen that, if properly promoted and produced, maple sugar could drive imported cane sugar from the American market, that New York and northern Pennsylvania had more than enough sugar maples to satisfy the entire national demand, 
and that American maple sugar could be exported profitably to Europe. By substituting for the most valuable agricultural commodity imported into the United States, maple sugar would alleviate the new nation's balance of payments deficit, striking a blow for economic independence. Deprived of their markets for cane sugar, West Indian planters would have to shut down their plantations and liberate their slaves. Produced by free families without exercising the lash of cruelty on our fellow creatures, American sugar would advance the day when the minds of men are become so liberal as to view liberty in its true light when slavery shall be done away. The money that was flowing into the coffers of importers and West Indian planters would instead pass into the pockets of American farmers, enhancing their standard of living. Become prosperous, farmers could readily pay their debts to landlords. Eager to share in that new prosperity, migrants would flock west to settle in the New York hills, paying increased prices for lands covered with sugar maples.16. But there was no time to waste, for settlers were wantonly and foolishly destroying the sugar maples by the thousands as they cleared the forest. Because maple trees... So here's the problem, is there's two things you can do with maple trees to make money off of them. One is you can tap them for maple uh, syrup and get sugar of them. Other is you can just knock them over and burn them and get a lot of potash, basically potassium that's used in fertilizer. Hmm. And that was hugely uh, uh, exported to Europe. And eventually, basically, everyone was just burning. The burning for potash won out over the maple syrup uh, industry and foolishly destroying the sugar maples by the thousands as they cleared the forest. Because maple trees were especially valuable for firewood or potash, they quickly attracted the interest and axes of new settlers. Cooper hoped to rescue from destruction these trees, these diamonds of America, these gifts of heaven, which never created anything in vain. Thousands of them are daily destroyed, I stand alone for their protection, and plainly perceive that our country will soon be deprived of them, but knowing their value, I now plead their cause. In the pioneers James Fenimore Cooper paraphrased his father's rhetoric, placed in the mouth of Judge Marmaduke Temple, who condemns the practice, which devotes these jewels of the forest, these precious gifts of nature, these mines of comfort and wealth, to the common use of a fireplace. Temple calls the maple trees jewels as Cooper called them diamonds, both evocations of the longing to find hidden treasures lurking in their lands.17. Cooper sought to conserve the sugar maples not out of any romantic aesthetic or any ecological sensibility but from a conviction that their long-term value as sugar producers vastly outweighed their immediate value as potash or firewood. He did not mean to stop all deforestation, merely to preserve the groves where sugar maples were most numerous, there is land enough where they stand thin, for the purpose of plowing, sowing, mowing, and pasture. Cooper was very much like Marmaduke Temple, who explains, it is not as ornaments that I value the noble trees of this country, it is for their usefulness, 18. And, uh, I mean, I feel like that that's a market solution to slavery, right? Mm-hmm. A- a- uh, at least idealistically. And Cooper himself would go around to these um, basically Whigs or people who were anti-slavery but very wealthy and say, hey, I'm going to uh, create this sugar that's going to displace all those uh, West Indian plantations that are you know have horrible slave labor practices. And don't you want to get in on this? And he did have like at least one benefactor that ended up like owning up most of the sugar, even though it was like rotten um, and like waterlogged. And basically the the growing season never really cooperated for him on the first couple of years. Yeah. Um, But what's funny is it impressed people like I think George Washington and um, Thomas Jefferson both put maple trees on their plantations. Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah. So and while they continued to own slaves, it's it shows, I think, rather comically the limitations of sort of uh, bourgeois, especially or even like very wealthy ref- philanthropic but market-based reformism right like yeah, we yeah. just need to do this through the market yeah uh and no you need to do the, the way you're going to get rid of slavery is through legislation or warfare it, yeah even if you like remove like the the moralistic gaze from it you just uh, the, the the planter class was definitely on an upward trajectory but it had not dominated the market just yet mm-hmm. but you could see like in the in the Constitution, you already have a an expiration date on the importation of slaves. America's number one trader at that time had just uh, the the England had outlawed slavery. You could see people who had like a um, a market mindset, basically being like, "We're going to run into some serious problems," right. <laughs> and it's like we should try to find a market based solution out of this uh, potential quagmire. Yeah, uh, and yeah, the lesson you should glean from that is that. There is not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I'll just say that uh, maple sugar is to 
cane sugar what um uh natural gas is to other fossil fuels yeah i was not gonna say elon work. musk is to uh climate crisis right yeah elon musk self-driving cars yeah that's it's not it guys his tunnels in the ground which i still don't understand how that's supposed to help the uh, environment uh, um yeah, the key to figuring that out is to note that elon is a charlatan oh right yeah uh because that like hyperloop tunnel yeah. um where it basically pulls your car along a track yeah uh, they have that in Montreal. It's called their subway system. Like the bus, <laughs> the the subways are on rubber tires underground yeah. and along these tracks, and they go very fast and it's very efficient. Elon Musk is not inventing that. Yeah. Uh, well, just imagine a uh, public transit, but it's decentralized. And with one, it can move one like little car at a time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking stupid. Um, uh, let's uh, move through the next few chapters here. Uh, so yeah, we, chapter nine talks a lot about the wastefulness of the s- settlers. Uh, Richard is very much a yellow vest guy. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth says that any man who treats women well is a gentleman. So we have some egalitarianism in chapter nine, um, and then we find out that Natty is protected by law. Uh, chapter ten, uh, people are going to the bold dragoon. Talks about uh, different kinds of churches. Uh, chapter 11, they go there in a, a church service done by Mr. Grant. It's a gender segregated. There's a, one guy there in an old artillery uniform because it's the best thing he's got, which is kind of an uh, endearing little image there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then yeah, Grant gives a bit of a sermon. Chapter 12, uh, Miss Temple and Grant's daughter meet. Uh, uh, Grant bothers John Mohegan about religion a little bit more. Uh, and then we have a few weird things about Ollie's. Ollie is a bit op- opaque about, or Oliver uh, Edwards is a bit opaque about what his background is and sort of um, misleads people to think he's a uh, descendant of Delaware Indians. Um, and then we also hear a bit of Natty's, this bit about Natty's background is a bit ambiguous. Yeah. Dissenters, though there never was an established church in their own country. No, no, interrupted Leatherstocking. I must away to the wigwam. There's work there that mustn't be forgotten for all your churchings and merrymakings. Let the lad go with you and welcome. He is used to keeping company with ministers and talking of such matters. So is old John, who was Christianized by the Moravians about the time of the old war. But I am a plain, unlearned man that has served both the king and his country in this day again, the French and savages, but never so much as looked into a book or learnt a letter of scholarship in my born days. I've never seen the use of much indoor work, though I have lived to be partly bald, and in my time have killed 200 beaver in a season, and that without counting the other game. If you mistrust what I am telling you, you can ask Chinchgotchcook there, for I did it in the heart of the Delaware country, and the old man is knowing to the truth of every word I say. I doubt not, my friend, that you have been both a valiant soldier and skillful hunter in your day, said the divine, but more is wanting to prepare you for that end which approaches. You may have heard the maxim that young men may die, but old men must. I'm sure I never was so great a fool as to expect to live forever, said Natty, giving one of his silent laughs. No man need do that who trails the savages through the woods, as I have done, and lives for the hot months on the lake streams. I have a strong constitution. I must say that for myself, as it is plain to be seen, for I've drunk the Onondaga water a hundred times while I've been watching the deer licks. When the fever and aggie seeds was to be seen in it as plenty as you can see the rattlesnakes on old Crumhorn. But then, I never expected to hold out forever, though there's them living who have seen the German flats a wilderness. I am them that's learned and acquainted with religion, too. Though you might look a week now and not find even the stump of a pine on them, and that's a wood that lasts in the ground the better part of a hundred years after the tree is dead. This is but time, my good friend, returned Mr. Grant who began to take an interest in the welfare of his new acquaintance. But I would have you prepare for eternity. It is incumbent on you to attend places of worship, as I am pleased to see that you have done this evening. Would it not be heedless in you to start on a day's toil of hard hunting and leave your ramrod at Flint behind? It must be a young hand in the woods, interrupted Natty (laughs) with another laugh, that didn't know how to dress a rod out of an ash sapling or find a firestone in the mountains. No, no, I never expected to live forever, 
but I see times be altering in these mountains from what they was thirty years ago, or for that matter ten years. But might makes right, and the law is stronger than an old man, whether he is one that has much laming, or only like me, that is better now at standing at the passes than following the hounds, as I once used to could. Hey ho! I never know preaching come into a settlement, but it made game scarce, and raised the price of gunpowder. And that's a thing not as easily made as a ramrod or an Indian flint. The divine, perceiving that he had given his opponent an argument by his own unfortunate selection of a comparison, very prudently relinquished the controversy. Uh, yeah, so I want to play this uh, bit uh, about Natty's background and what James Fenimore Cooper intended for the uh, character here and how he might have self-censored himself a bit later. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Hello. I'm sorry. Dave, Hello. Davis. Hello. Where My are you husband, calling from? Uh, lineage goes back to uh, James Fenimore Cooper, and we have heard that he was part Mohican. Uh, is this true, or do you know anything about that? All right. Thank you very much. Any idea? Uh, I would doubt it very seriously. Any idea? Uh, certainly not. <laughs> Why do you doubt it very seriously? Well, he came from the wrong place and the wrong people. That's but on I mean. the other hand, haven't you, uh, I, I saw on a note that you had a, your own theory about uh, Natty Bumpo himself. Oh, Natty was, yeah, intended uh, originally in the Pioneers, I believe, as, as a, a mixed blood. Mixed and, blood? Yes, which means he was uh, part um, uh, Lenape, D Delaware, and he was part um, European, his father would have been. Dr. Uh, Taylor, do you have any problem with that theory? Uh, no, I find it an intriguing uh, theory. I think in the last of the Mohicans, he's at great pains to to cover that track. Yes. Did you agree with that? Well, yeah. Well, you know, when he started the Pioneers in 1823, it was still respectable. There was still that Enlightenment era um, uh, positive regard for Native Americans that slipped very deeply. The more America went into the antebellum era, the more heavily, deeply racist America became because it had to support slavery and it had to support um, really bloody conquest uh, of the rest of the continent. Um, before that time, it, there was recognized that there was race mixing in the country. It was not a screaming, crying shame. They knew that natives, Africans, and whites mixed, especially on the frontiers, that most of the children in the villages were mixed at some point. And especially somebody like Natty was mixed because uh, he was Moravian. The only way, the only way that anyone uh, became a Moravian was either to be born one of German parentage, like Heckwalder, or to uh, have been among the Delaware. A, a Native American because they only preached. They only preached to the Delaware. Doc, His mother had to have been Delaware. Dr. Taylor, on this, the, the, the nonfiction. Uh, I love that yeah. uh, analysis. That is super interesting. Um, that's exactly what this podcast is made for. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, you know, it's, it's hard to think of like you know I think that a lot of social things social things especially in American history I thought of as like linear that they just keep getting better over time or worse over time but the the idea of like race science and and intermixing and stuff like that that really didn't that wasn't so much a part of like the American story until like the 1830s 1840s and 1850s mm -hmm. when the idea of like the inferiority of X Y and Z was really hammered out yeah and the material I mean and it was subsidized by the material uh, underpinnings of that, right? Like King Cotton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was, yeah, we need some way to justify this, basically. Yeah. All right, uh, and uh, we got one final clip to play here. Um, we're going to move on through uh, uh, Chapter 13, which is at the Bold Dragoon. A dragoon is a British sort of cavalry um, uh, officer, and the Bold Dragoon sure, is I a... Think or maybe, it's, not, it's a French soldier, I think. Could be French. I, I, I the the definition I just brought up on Google said British, but oh, okay. um, uh, yeah, it could be basically cavalry, um, and that's the bar. Uh, basically, and at this bar, this is, they go to the bar after church, which is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, to talk about church, uh, there's a lot of public discourse in there, um, and then basically. Uh, yeah, th and then they start talking a little bit about uh, the Jacobin menace. Uh, this oh, yeah. is in chapter 14. After a short pause, Hiram ventured a question. What news does the judge bring us from the legislature? It's not likely that Congress has done much this session. Or maybe the French haven't fit any more battles lately. The French, since they have beheaded their king, have done nothing but fight, returned the judge. The character of the nation seems changed. I knew many French gentlemen during our war, and they all appeared to me to be men of great humanity and goodness of heart. 
but these Jacobins are as bloodthirsty as bulldogs. There was one Rachenbaugh with us down at Yorktown, cried the landlady. A mighty pretty man he was, too, and their horse was the very same. It was there that the sergeant got hurt in the leg from the English batteries. Bad luck to him. Oh, mon pauvre roi, muttered Monsieur Lacoy. <laughs> the legislature have been passing laws, continued Marmaduke. Now, this is interesting because the legislature is still getting stuff done. And actually, this is a fairly interesting summary of the French Revolution. Yeah, yeah. Which is that there's all this blood stuff going on, but certain bourgeois reforms uh -huh. uh, against feudalism, but for, you know, landholders, yeah. uh, the enclosure of the commons was carrying on a pace while it was going on. That the country much required. Among others, continued Marmaduke, that the country much required. Among others is an act prohibiting the drawing of sayings at any other than proper seasons. Drawing of sayings is like a type of uh, net that you can catch a lot of fish in. That comes up and we'll do that in part two of this episode. In certain of our streams and small lakes. And another to prohibit the killing of deer in the teeming months. These are laws that were loudly called for by judicious men. Nor do I despair of getting an act to make the unlawful felling of timber a criminal offense. The hunter listened to this detail with breathless attention, and when the judge had ended, he laughed in open derision. You may make your laws, judge, he cried, but who will you find to watch the mountains through the long summer days, or the lakes at night? Game is game, and he who finds may kill. That has been the law in these mountains for forty years, to my certain knowledge, and I think one old law is worth two new ones. None but a green would wish to kill a doe with a fawn by its side, unless his moccasins were getting old or his leggings ragged. So there's Natty being a bit naive about yeah. what uh, people will do once they get in the frontier. And he'll be proven wrong later in this story. Yeah, like uh, this law has been around for over 40 years. Yeah, yeah man. <laughs> for the flesh is lean and coarse, but a rifle rings among the rocks along the lake shore, sometimes as if 50 pieces were fired at once. It would be hard to tell where the man stood who pulled the trigger. Armed with the dignity of the law, Mr. Bumpo, returned the judge gravely, a vigilant magistrate can prevent much of the evil that has hitherto prevailed, and which is already rendering game scarce. I hope to live to see the day when a man's rights in his game shall be as much respected as title to his farm. Your titles and your farms are all new together, cried Natty, but laws should be equal and not more for one than another. I shot a deer last Wednesday. This is class politics. Mm -hmm. More for one than another. I shot a deer last Wednesday, was a fortnight, and it floundered through the snowbanks till it got over a brush fence. I catched the lock of my rifle in the twigs in falling and was kept back until finally the creature got off. Now I want to know who is to pay me for that deer. And a fine buck it was. If it hadn't been a fence, I should have gotten another shot onto it, and I never drawed upon anything that hadn't wings three times running in my born days. No, no, Judge, it's the farmers that makes the game scarce, and not the hunters. Tea deer, deer is not so plainly as tea old were, Pumpo, said the Major, who had been an attentive listener amid clouds of smoke. Put the lot is not might as for to tear to live, but for Christians. Why, Major, I believe you're a friend to justice and to the right though you go so often to the grand house. But it's a hard case to a man to have his honest calling for a livelihood stopped by laws. And that, too, when, if right was done, he might hunt or fish on any day in the week or on the best flat in the patent, if he was so minded. I understand you'll let her stalk it, returned the major, fixing his black eyes with a peculiar look of meaning on the hunter. But you didn't used to be so prudent as to look at me so much care. Maybe there wasn't so much occasion, said the hunter, a little sulkily, when he sank into silence from which he was not roused for some time. The judge was saying something about the French, Hiram observed, when the pause in the conversation had continued a decent time. Yes, sir, returned Marmaduke. The Jacobins of France seem rushing from one act of licentiousness to another. They continue those murders which are dignified by the name of executions. You have heard that they have added the death of their queen, to the long list of their crimes. Le monsters, again murmured Monsieur Lacoy, turning himself suddenly in his chairs with a convulsive start. The province of La Vendinée is laid waste by the troops of the Republic, 
and hundreds of its inhabitants, who are royalist in their sentiments, are shot at a time. Le Vendinet is a district of the southwest of France that continues yet much attached to the family of the Bourbons. Doubtless Monsieur Le Coy is acquainted with it and can describe it more faithfully. No, 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 mon cher ami, returned the Frenchman in a suppressed voice, but speaking rapidly and gesticulating with his right hand as if for mercy, while with his left he concealed his eyes. So that was the Van D, which was the, uh, the Bourbon loyalist uh, holdout uh, city in the French Revolution that ended up getting a lot of uh, people slaughtered. That was mentioned in the Oscar Wilde um, was section. That, that's not the same one that uh, Feuerbach? Did, did Feuerbach mention the Von D? Wait, no, I'm, I'm messing up my names. Who's the one who he lost his inheritance? Oh, Foyer. Foyer, yeah. Is that the same town? Uh, not the same town. No, no different town. But uh, it was the same town that Oscar Wilde says, like, the point isn't that the the, the tragedy of the Von yeah. D isn't that uh, is that um, peasants went to die for the hideous uh, cause of uh, feudalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that like people were like got uh, caught up in revolutionary violence. Yeah, um, that is uh, where we will put a peg in this one. Uh, that's part one of the pioneers, the sources of the Susquehanna. Uh, I would, I think this book is v- very easily worth two uh, episodes. Um, Alex, do you have anything else you want to mention on this episode before we log off? Uh, yeah, just one like side note, not necessarily like apropos of anything, but there's this constant reference in, particularly in the sections that we read, but in the book as a whole, of uh, motion and change and and how there's almost this kind of anxiety about the the nature of the landscape and thus the nature of life in this in. Uh, New York State is changing so rapidly that you get the sense that Cooper wanted to write it down so it might live on like in some other version and that you when you look at the like exquisite detail of nature you almost you're getting a rendering of a state that no longer exists and you know someone who lives in New York State and has you know gone beyond New York City every now and again it it is nice to or it it's a welcome kind of artifact of a different world that you happen to share the same space with. Yeah. And uh, just one thing I want to mention that's kind of interesting uh, an, an omission is I appreciate that uh, Cooper in, includes, you know, both that uh, this stuff is basically uh, expedited by slave labor, mm-hmm. um, but also uh, the, you know, the um, political anxiety of some of these men about the French Revolution. Yeah. The one thing that is omitted in this that was a big part of William Cooper's life when he was a judge was yearly elections. <laughs> and there is nothing about campaigning in this. Yeah. And that's because uh, James Wilmer Cooper wasn't a fan of electoral politics. I mean, yeah. it, it, it was very hard on his father's uh, reputation um, I mean, because his father was kind of a bit of a... Very successful scam artist, like <laughs> like successfully, you can successfully found towns and still be kind of like basically the, the fundamental thing that William Cooper did was he would buy these lands in often shady ways, and then he would start settling them first and then measuring them and surveying them later, which created problems every single time with overlapping you know yeah. property and shit like that. And it ultimately created huge legal things, but it's like, let's just get people on the land. Anyway, um, Literary Hangover, uh, or patreon.com slash literary hangover if, if you want to support the show. Uh, we're moving up to 250 patrons, which means I'm getting close to start streaming uh, on Twitch and YouTube. Um, so that's going to be coming up um, in the next couple of weeks for patrons, and then once we get to 250 for everybody. Um, but... Uh, yeah, that's the, for this week. We'll have um, the next George Orwell we're doing is a hanging, uh, and then we'll finish up uh, part two, and we'll have Grace in here, I think, for uh, shooting an elephant and uh, other things we have coming up. Um, I'm going to make a list, so uh, check that out on patreon.com slash literary hangover as well. Uh, also, f- uh, follow us on YouTube. Anyway, Alex, thank you. Yep. And uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>